Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Spaced Out Radio tonight. We got a great show for you as we have legendary filmmaker, journalist Bryce Zabel with us tonight talking about the UFO narrative. And this is going to be an incredible show because a lot of us talk about the narrative, but we're going to get into it in just a few minutes with Bryce because we want to make sure you are very educated on this topic. There is a UFO narrative. There is something going on that is absolutely holding us back. What that is, we're going to try and find out tonight. Before we bring Bryce on, let's say hello to everyone in our chat room tonight. Black Dragon in the gold medal position. Race Fan takes home the silver with Stu Pot in the bronze medal position. Hello, SJ. How are you, my friend? James Horn, good to see you. Thanks for coming on in. The lovely Jenny Metz has returned, everyone. All right, scrolling on down, there's Chad Smith, everybody. The Chad Smith. All right, as we continue on with the roll call, Jay Fox Hunter, good to see you. Todd Purden, oh, gorgeous. Ozzy Ange is here. There she is, everyone. Mennonite Abe, good to see you, my friend. Thanks for coming on in. Appreciate you. Nosferatu, you uh, extraterrestrial bastard. Okay, yeah, I'll be one of those. Sure, what the hell. All right, Snakes on a UFO, Lone Wanderer, good to see you guys. And there's uh, gorgeous Jenny Metz once again. Peppa H., good to see you. As we continue on, Apollo 11, nice to have you back, my friend. Thank you. Open-minded clarity, always a pleasure to have you here. Cat Chaser, thank you so much for kicking off the Super Chat tonight. Very much appreciate you and your continued support of SOR. We love you. Thank you so much. As we continue on here, Magnus Zerum, nice to have you back. Mama Susan, Solar Warden, good to see all of you. Thank you for coming on in. And uh, let's see, who else arrived here? As we scroll on down, Uncle Dale and his power stash are here. Remember, you can get an autograph from Uncle Dale and his power stash after the show. Line up to the left of the studio, if you don't mind, to the left of the studio. Stephen Edmund, the Michael Leger is here, everyone. The Michael Leger. There he is. And uh, let's continue on here. Rooted in Gorgeous Sacredness is here. She'll be signing autographs after the show as well. Line up to the right of the studio. You got Uncle Dale on the left. Rooted in Gorgeous Sacredness on the right. Millennium, nice to have you here, my friend. Good to have you back. Jurassic Joey, thanks for coming on in. And we continue on here. Kevin, what's going on, my friend? Good to have you here. There's Bryce Zabel. We'll bring him on momentarily. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, well, well, we can just leave him here as well because he is part of the show. All right. Continuing on, Fidgety Aura, Excaliperful. Nice to have you guys here. Thank you so much. Gorgeous Jenny, good to see you. Thank you, my favorite wrench. Yola Tango, nice to have you here. Ozzy, Ozzy, oi, oi to you, my friend. There we go. Now we got that out of the way. We continue on with our scrolling. Grant, Grant Tavius, Sultry Susie, good to see you. Raven is Ryan, nice to have you back. Gorgeous Marie in L.A., Thanks for coming on in. $5,900. Glenn John McEnroe, the pride of Wimbledon. Bonjour, Jean Baptiste. How you doing, my friend in Alberta? Nice to have you here. And there she is, gorgeous science Melinda from Australia, followed by the lovely Anne Celine. YJ in Project Blue Book. Good to see you guys. Thanks for coming in. And uh, we will have new T-shirts as of Monday when the new website is launched. Fabster, always a pleasure. Sam Faz and Guillaume, how are you guys? Thanks for joining us as we continue on here. Boz Monster and uh, Ivo Sevich, how are you? Thanks for joining us. And Mark Rademacher, how are you, my friend? Sonny Conway, Richard Elmore, Vin Man, and Irish Lincoln. Donnie C., how you doing? And uh, we're running out of time here. We always run out of time doing this. The gorgeous Manitoba Becky. There she is, the pride of branded Manitoba. We call her the weak queen around here. Stunning Avi May. How are you? Snakes, thank you so much for that awesome super chat. Really do appreciate it. It's a great way to do support this show and what we do on a nightly basis. So thank you so much. And uh, let's see, who else do we have here joining us? Bob Birkins, good to have you here. We'll have more coming on in because that's the way it happens. The lovely and talented Kira. We want to say uh, that the Super Chat is a great way to support what we do on a nightly basis. Hello, gorgeous Golden Lee A. And, of course, hit that subscribe button. Ring that bell if you have not been here before and you love our channel. We hope that we can earn a thumbs up or down as well. Get your horns up. We're going to get going right now. <laughs> Hey, 
from the mountains of central British Columbia to you listening around the world. This, my friends, is Spaced Out Radio. I am your host, Dave Scott, sitting in the captain's chair of SOR headquarters. We welcome you to tonight's show on our terrestrial affiliates around North America, digitally on TalkStream Live, Revolution Radio, and KPNL. All of our archives are free by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do old Davey the favor, hit that subscribe button. You can follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. Our website is spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Tonight's show is brought to you by Chive Charities. Help make the world 10% happier by visiting Chive Charities today. You can find them on our website. Our guest tonight is definitely no stranger when it comes to breaking news. Bryce Zabel is a former CNN correspondent. He now helps make documentaries. You can follow him on Twitter at Hollywood UFOs. Not only is he very familiar from being in front of the camera and telling the story, but he does it behind the camera as well. He's very educated. He's very influential in the field of UFOs when it comes to dealing with some of the biggest names in ufology, a researcher, a developer, someone who literally has done it all on the trail of the saucers, and we're so glad to have him back. It's been a couple of years since we had him on, but what we really okay. need to talk with with Bryce tonight is this incredible narrative that we have seen going on for almost four years now in the UFO field. We're going to break it all down for you tonight. Bryce, thank you so much for coming on Space Down Radio. How are you? I'm doing I'm great. Doing great. I, I thought it was just so impressive to see all these people who are here. I want to thank them all for being here and all the ones who come in. Very impressive. I've got my fully leaded uh, coffee on board here. So I'm ready to, I'm ready to roll and uh, tear down a narrative or two with you. All right, Bryce, you are somebody who, like me, I mean, you had way more experience than I ever did. I almost did 10 years in mainstream media, but you built a, a life and a, and a career off of journalism and mainstream television and the stories that go behind it. How do you go from being a professional journalist from what you were back in the day, going all the way up to mm -hmm. CNN, now going after the UFO story? How did that happen? I don't think, uh, <clears throat> first of all, I don't think of myself, maybe other people do, but I don't think of myself as a retired journalist or an ex-journalist or anything of the sort uh, because I got uh, trained as a journalist. I you know, went to the school of University of Oregon and, and in broadcast news. So I think you always have those feelings about, hey, if I don't have the answer to something, I'm not going to just take anybody's word for it. I'll make some phone calls. I'll talk to people. I'll, I'll, you know, till the soil a little bit, find out what's under underneath it. So um, you don't actually go from here to there. You're sort of a journalist and then you might do other things with your, you know, your journalistic expertise or whatever. So I think that's kind of what I'm doing. I, uh, uh, I certainly did divert for a period of time into uh, uh, all television and, and features. Now I'm also doing a little reporting on the uh, Trail of the Saucers site. I just think there's so much going on, which I know we're, we're, we're about to get into, but there's just so much going on. It'd be a terrible time to only be doing one thing and to be standing on the sidelines. So I'm in there. This is a topic that could really encapsulate someone. And I want to start off tonight before we get into the narrative, over the last few years, we have seen a lot of media outlets, big name media outlets, jump on the UFO uh, bandwagon. As a journalist yourself, have you been happy with this coverage or have you been satisfied but felt they could have done more or are you disappointed with the way they've led the story? I'm not happy with it in that uh, I would like to see um, more of the mainstream media's commit to it and to put some of their firepower in a full-time position to look into it. If indeed it's the biggest story of our lifetimes or anybody's lifetime, then it seems like we we sort of ought to be able to do that. I mean, we were able to put Woodward and Bernstein pretty much full-time on Watergate. I'm not sure why why they're not doing more of that. Now, having said that, the actual product that comes out, I, I, you know, about 80 to 90% of it is just retreading things, you know, things that you know, and I know, and the, the people who are listening to us know we've heard before, and it's kind of being, you know, re regurgitated or repackaged, but it's not breaking new ground. 
most of that is okay when it happens that way because there's still a lot of people that are trying to catch up on the topics. I don't I don't take issue with it. What I what I do take issue with is what I would call the lazy reporting, where and you you know it, it's given away immediately when somebody. I mean, the, the classic giveaway is if any reporter writes little green men into any article, it's like, okay, I'm done with you. I mean, that's it. And if they if they sort of uh, have kind of a above it all sneering kind of attitude, I'm not into that. But increasingly, uh, there is good reporting being done uh, outside the mainstream, in the mainstream. Um, not all of it is perfect, uh, but that but that would be true of any topic, right? I mean, uh, journalism is always hitting a moving target. Uh, journalism is what they call the first draft of history, right? So I do believe that the history books uh, are all going to have to be rewritten once we sort of disclose this reality to ourselves. But that doesn't mean that journalism has to get it 100% right all the time. We just have to be moving in the right direction. What's bothered me about it is the fact that they have only taken it so far. They've only taken the story so right. far. They haven't pushed the limits of what other people know. And I, I kind of blame the To The Stars Academy on this. The reason why is they trotted out Chris Mellon. They trotted yeah. out Luis Elizondo. They trotted out David Fravor. And it was basically like, you don't really need to sub uh, to go delve into this subject. We're going to give you what you need. Right. And that was just good enough. You didn't yeah. see Dolan. You didn't see Grant Cameron. You didn't see any of these long time, even the late Stanton Friedman before he passed away. Right. You didn't see any of them coming on for commentary or the second part of the story. And I found that very disappointing with the media because it really showed in my eyes that really the media didn't know what to do or how to all of a sudden take this topic well, after but, years of complaining and griping about it. But, but, and you're so right about that, but what's really the dynamic, the dynamic historically in the mainstream media. And I even hate to use that we're in, in media in general. Okay. Over the years has been to keep this topic at, at arm's length, because the one thing a journalist cannot handle is being made fun of, right. For, for going off on a on a wild goose chase, right? That that's a, a career killer. So they can't have that. What's going on right now is that increasingly uh, reporters around the country, local reporters and national reporters and international reporters, are starting to say, you know, there's a lot of smoke there, but there's some fire as well. There's a lot of signal, but uh, and a lot of noise, but there's a a signal, and you're starting to get people waking up. If I was running a newsroom, I mean, hey, I would love to grab a couple of reporters from any of the major newspapers and say, this is a big story. We're going to start breaking stories in it. Whatever else you're working on, we'll handle it. Get to work on this one. You're full time. That's what I would like to see happen. Now, on the other hand, there are moments where you start to say, well, there's a promise. I mean, I, I don't know if you what you think about it, but I just read uh, Ross's uh, In Plain Sight. And what I like about what I read there is here's a guy that's a, 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 a investigative reporter in Australia who just basically said, I'm going to take a couple of years and look into this and get back to people. I, uh, and he was honest, you know, about what, who he talked to and how he talked to them and, and what he learned and how he's changed his opinion on certain things. So I think we're by degrees, not perfect, a little bit at a time, but we're getting there. And I, and I want to see that, but I guess the follow-up questions yeah. is what's really irking me because when I went to broadcasting school, we were always taught, look, ask the first question or feed off the first question, but never be afraid to F ask the follow-up. Yes, and we're absolutely. Not, I mean, the DNI report is a great example of that. Not a single journalist asked, why did we not go prior to 2004? What yeah, absolutely. About it's It's crazy. It's crazy. That's crazy. But here's something else that's crazy. This whole thing sort of got rolling in the modern time on December 17th, 2017, right? That a day that will be etched in our minds, all right, with the New York Times article. Uh, so that was uh, three years before the 2020 election. We went through how many debates between the Democrats and the Republicans and the and and how many, and Trump and, and Biden and the vice presidents had a total of four debates. 
Was there no time in any of those dozens of debates for a reporter to just really get into that? How could how is that still happening? Okay, I think that's kind of an in indicator of where we stand in that people are still afraid to be seen as taking it seriously, and that still bums me out. And I I, I want to do what I can, and I know you're doing what you can, and so are the people listening to us to try to make that a little less uh, common. But that's you know, if if you want a, an example of where we're going wrong, that's a good one. We can't even. In a, in a debate that goes on hours in a matter of public policy, talking about national security, ask about UAP. And and again, you are so right also about the report. If, you know, I read the report and I, while I think there were things that were good about it, I'm not going to trash it a uh, uh, 100% by any means, but it made it sound like nothing was going on until 2004 with the Nimitz, right? And And I'm thinking, well, Okay, if all you do is you think UFOs really got kicked off in 2004, then you would not be blamed for thinking, well, maybe they're China or Russia because, hey, and since 2004, they probably got pretty good tech. But if you start to think about those same objects being sighted in 1945, 6, and 7, and 8 through the 50s, well, China didn't even have an air force at the beginning of that. And Russia certainly wasn't building them at that point. So... I think what we've done by degrees is move into phases. Phase one is we admit they're real. Phase two is we admit we don't make them. Phase three is we say we don't think China or Russia make them. So we're now rapidly getting to where we'll be able to call ourselves in phase four, which is, well, do the math, folks. If we don't make them and they don't make them and they're real, who does make them? Well, and I think people are starting to finally figure that out because in the most recent interviews over the last couple months, we've seen Chris Mellon and Luis Elizondo kind of shy away from using the words Russia and yes. China. And I, and I think that was a very, very good move in regards to that because when you eliminate the vocabulary, you're now not saying it. And that says a lot if you're not saying it. Yeah, absolutely. And and there's an interest. Um, you know, uh, uh, we have a I have a site on the Medium publication called Trail of the Saucers. And um, uh, my co-editor, uh, David Bates, wrote an article. I think it was titled something like uh, UAP are not made by Russia or China and the Pentagon knows this. And it got the most reads of anything we did last month because people are hungry to say, that's true, damn it. I know that's true. I want to read more about it. So I, I look, uh, if you look at almost any major social uh, issue of our lifetimes and even preceding our lifetimes, the public tends to get it first and then the institutions kind of catch up. OK, so that was probably true of civil rights and it was true of the Vietnam War. And it'll probably be true of UFO disclosure disclosure. The public is going to get hip to this a little faster the institute, than the institutions. And, and the other thing is we don't have to wait for the institutions. We can just get on with this ourselves, like what you're doing right now and what your your listeners and viewers are doing. We're all sort of waking up simultaneously right now and it's we're moving the ball ourselves. As much as we try to move the ball ourselves, are people listening, though? Because we know the mainstream media really doesn't care about the entire UFO field, as long as it's Elizondo or Mellon. We know that the mainstream public, through everything that is going on right now, really does not have time for you know, to step out of their out of their own livelihoods right now. Could this topic have come at a worse time than what we are seeing right now? Well, I, that's a pretty good point because the truth is we live in some pretty extraordinarily tough times, chaotic times, discouraging times, depressing times. I mean, the, the, clearly the, the environment is in trouble. Uh, clearly we have not been good stewards of the earth and things are, are tough. And politically, we can't seem to agree on, on even how to save ourselves from a pandemic. So we just have a lot of, a lot of trouble in the, in the body politic, if you will. I remain, though, kind of optimistic. Uh, I think often what is counterintuitive may be the intuitive choice. Which, And so in this case, you'd say, well, maybe this isn't even a good time to disclose. It, we're, in, we're so screwed up right now, it could only make things worse. But I could also argue that 
yeah, these are really tough times right now. And maybe the only, only thing out there that is going to get humanity thinking like we're all part of the same team is for us to get on with this closure. Because then at, at least at that point, we're all going to have to admit that there's probably more uh, uniting us in similarities as human beings than than dividing us. I mean, to the, you know, I, I'm, I'm very big on uh, researching and, and I, I'm uh, developing the Betty and Barney Hill story for, for television. And, you know, you think about it, if Betty and Barney Hill were abducted and that happened, then it's pretty clear that the one thing that the aliens didn't seem to care about was the color of his skin. Right. I mean, everybody right. else that he dealt with in his life, no, saw that he was a black man married to a white woman, but it doesn't sound like the aliens did, right? So I, I, maybe there's some hope here, maybe. Well, I mean, it, it's one of those things that we are going to have to, you know, eyeball over the next little bit because nobody is talking aliens. We're barely talking ships right now. I yeah. can give you a great example of some very poor reporting that I've seen up here in Canada where a couple of months ago, the Canadian Television News Network, CTV, had their Washington Bureau reporter, their D.C. Bureau reporter, sure. interview Chris Mellon for 14 minutes. Not yeah. one question was asked about whether or not Canada was having anything to do with UFOs. Did the Canadian government know about UFOs? How stupid is that? And I mean, then the CBC, the, CBC, the CBC, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, flies their Washington, D.C. Bureau chief over to Wyoming to interview Lou Elizondo for two hours. And in their 17-minute hit, did not mention Canadian airspace, Canadian airspace security, UFOs, nothing. It was all about what was going on in the south of the border, which is well, it's really strange to me. It's, it's totally strange, but you know what it also is, is it may not even say much about uh, ufology or UFOs or UFO UAP reality as much as it says about just sort of a, a sort of lazy journalism uh, practiced by uh, people who are working day to day, because clearly, I mean, I don't know, back when I went, it was in journalism school, which does seem like, well, it was in the last century. We know that uh, my professors wouldn't have allowed that kind of thinking to prevail. They would have said, you got to get the local angle. Well, if you're a Canadian reporter and you get your hands on Elizondo or Mellon, two of the brightest lights we've got out there, and you're talking to them about a topic they seem informed about, and you don't ask them about Canada, well, you know, you should just resign and let somebody I, else do the I job. Agree. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. But it, to me, it shows the lack of real preparation. It is. For this. Yeah. You know, but, if I read my, but if I read my audience correctly, how much has social media hurt the mainstream journalistic take on this story? Because... We're all about clickbait headlines now. Yeah. We're all about the feels. We're not about telling the story. We're about, you know, I've never in the last 10 years seen more reporters get involved in a story yeah. rather than tell the story. I mean, is journalism on a mainstream front really dead from what you and I were trained on compared to what we see now? You know, uh, listen, uh, it would be pretty easy for you and I to spend a couple hours and name a lot of things that mainstream journalism is getting wrong. And I don't know that that necessarily helps that much because the truth is, yeah, there's always good reporters and there's bad reporters. But for example, I, uh, to use Ross uh, uh, Coltart, uh, you know, uh, again, his book has a lot to do with the country he's from, Australia. He's got the local angle covered. And in fact, he, he did uh, the world a favor by, by so bringing uh, Australia to life that those of us who read his book in the United States and Canada have to say, yeah, I guess this is a worldwide phenomenon. So it's mixed. It's always going to be mixed. And and um, it was always mixed, though. I mean, think about it. Go back to Watergate. All right. Woodward and Bernstein got it and they wrote it hard. But it wasn't until they it looked like they really had a story that the the other newspapers said, yeah, maybe we should cover this a little more aggressively. Everybody has to wait to see that the water's fine. So one of the best things that could happen right now would be if the New York Times, instead of writing one article every six months, literally wrote an article a week. 
you know, and just said, we're going to bring people up to speed. We're going to be doing uh, radical, hard journalism, and we're going to be uh, pressing people for questions. Like, you know, I got to be honest with you. Um, I know Biden has a lot on his mind right now, and and uh, I don't want to get into the politics of, of, of you know, I, on that level, but how is it possible that in a time when the this report came out on June 25th that the president of the United States or in fact the vice president vice president Harris who was on the Senate Intelligence Committee and voted for that report when she was a senator how is it possible they're not getting asked about this how is it possible that they don't have to go on the record how why is that acceptable in 2021 I don't understand it. I don't think it's right. And I think it's got to change. Now, that can change because institutionally, as you point out, you know, journalism can up its game, but there's other ways. You know, we're just going to have to uh, demand that our representatives do a little more work. Well, we got, we got two minutes before we have to go to break at the bottom yeah. of the hour. Bryce Zabel, Trail of the Saucers, is on here, and you can find him on Medium uh, for Trail of the Saucers. I mean, this is going to be a great topic. When we come back from the break, I want to get into the narrative sanction of everything because I don't know about you, but when I first saw that to the Stars Academy, uh, not to bring up old hat or old news, but their first press conference. Sure. There was two things that kind of got my mind that day. Number one, no press at a press conference. That one, that one was a red flag for me. That's number, kind of a problem. Yeah. And number two, I'm looking outside of Tom DeLong, a bunch of people that all have ties to Robert Bigelow, and that was never mentioned either. Yeah, well, because, you know why it wasn't mentioned? None of the, the reporters who weren't there wouldn't have known anyway because they didn't know who Robert Bigelow was and they hadn't done any any investigation to find out whether they all worked for Bigelow or knew him or, or, or you know. So it's like it just takes a while to get the engine up and running. And it's it's not quite there. The, the public's more interested in this currently than journalists. But I got to tell you, there are a lot of journalists who, if if given the, uh, the go-ahead from their management, uh, uh, would love to dive into this story. It's a juicy story, and it's going to be the gift that keeps on giving uh, in disclosure. Where you know that the stories never will end once we get this out before everybody. Well, I hope that's right because we do need some investigation. But I mean, I what I see from there are very few investigative journalists like Ross Coldhart who are still. Yeah there if you hear the siren in the background that's because the the japanese aren't coming no, the they're coming for coming. you my friend all that trash talking of journalism yeah. and the government they're coming for you yep yeah, the I, I expect the uh the black bears to be around yes. here in no time <laughs> literally no time bryce yeah. i'm gonna get you to hold on right there sure. we're gonna step away for a break here at the bottom of the hour bryce Abel, the ufo narrative we're gonna start getting deep into the narrative when we come back here on spaced out radio why is there a narrative? How did it begin? Why are we not talking about it more on Spaced Out Radio? couple of my listeners, uh, I would adore to have Tom DeLong on Spaced Out Radio. He will never come on this show, ever. Uh, Tom? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. I think he's a little gun shy right now. He he got a lot of blowback from his uh, you know what he and and also, let's face it. I mean, how would you feel if you were running an organization and you had a mass desertion at the end of the year? That would be you know, I'm sure he's still kind of reeling and wondering, you know, that's why he's kind of retreated into rock stardom again because at least that's safe and secure for him and his foray into ufology kind of collapsed. And to this day, to this day, nobody has really investigated what precipitated the collapse at, T TTS, at, at, at uh, TTSA, right? And why is that? I don't know. But I'll tell you one thing. I, d I wrote an article for uh, uh, Trail of the Saucers right after the, in February when they filed their um, SEC report. And you know, basically, they tried to say, oh, yeah, we're just all about entertainment now. That's really the right choice. Give me a break. We don't need another entertainment company doing alien movies. 
when we, when Lou know. left, when Lou left a couple of days later, I wrote an article on on my 14 reasons why I never supported the TTSA. From what right. I heard, Jim Semivan read that and he he like and I had never interviewed anybody from that group. This was just outside observation sure. of what I had noticed. And Jim said that I had it about 95 to 98 percent right. There was well, some- so tell me what your conclusion was then. What what did you what were you stating there? Well, I, I stated the press list press conference. Okay, right. Okay. Good. The we're here for the public and we're not uh, giving the public anything. Okay. Sure. Uh, Tom DeLong going on Joe Rogan was a major faux pas, especially when he started talking about whipping his dick out on the air. Yeah, that's not a real crowd yeah. pleaser. No, maybe that, it is a crowd pleaser, but not for that crowd. No, that crowd, no. from what I heard from a couple of insiders, that really pissed a few people off. Yeah. Really pissed a few people off. Uh, I would have to bring it up here. Um, for, let me just bring it up here. Um, I got it here. I, I but just, I, you know, I know people have trashed the, the Tom DeLong on Joe Rogan, but I watched it a couple months ago just. I think for the second time, I kind of enjoyed it, you know, because I, because he did kind of forget that he was on a hot mic. You know what I'm saying? He he kind of was saying things that he probably should have thought right more about. And so I looked at it as okay, this guy, if he, I mean, what do people usually get in trouble for when they do interviews for actually saying the truth or saying what they're thinking? Right? They don't. Right. They right, so uh, he seems to have gotten in trouble for this because he didn't exercise enough discretion to yeah. shut up from time to time. Right. But that made me want to hear what he had to say even more because he was clearly floating his own opinions about what he thinks is going on. And if he's had the high level talks that he says he's had, then I found that interesting. Well, uh, here are my 14. I'm not going to read my examples. Yeah. I'm just going to read my 14. Uh, number one was a press list press conference. Number two was denial of media requests. That mm-hmm. one, uh, that one, Lou Elizondo actually came out and apologized to me and a number of, of other people when we finally got him on the air and said, we weren't, we didn't even know these media requests were being turned down. And the media person for the two of the Stars Academy was Tom's sister, Carrie DeLong. Uh, number three was TTSA name on the U U S Navy videos, how the Navy never went after them. Yeah. All right. That one needed to be questioned. Uh, no talking aliens, you know, and like I've said, like I always say on this show, when you've never seen aliens or a UFO, it's never aliens. But when you're an experiencer, it's always aliens, right? You, you know, yeah. yet we weren't allowed to talk, uh, uh, UFOs, uh, the political side of DeLong, UFOs are a very non-political issue. They're bipartisan. And yet when, you know, they're getting all of the news coverage on Fox and President Trump was speaking about it at that time. Um, you know, the fact that he was, uh, really disparaging President Trump, love him or hate him. Doesn't matter. That was uh, something. Then he came out, said they were anti-ufology and all of his posts that he removed, the Joe Rogan experience, the TTSA is not a UFO group, uh, playing the mainstream media to the narrative, uh, trying to buy the free experiencer stats uh, when he was pushing a negative uh, alien agenda. Uh, there was just a, a ton of things. I, I, we got to go on in a couple of sure. seconds. Yeah, Thank yeah. you, Snakes on a Train and Cat Chaser, for the awesome super chats. It's a great way to support what we do. Let's start the second half hour right now. Second half hour of Spaced Out Radio is now underway. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate 
earning your listening ears. Want to remind you that if you miss portions of this show or others, you can check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website, spacedoutradio.com, has a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. We're talking the UFO narrative tonight. Journalist Bryce Zabel is with us from Trail of the Saucers on Medium. You want to check that on out, Bryce. Let's get right into the Medium because the narrative is something that has really been pushing. I have been saying for almost four years, you know, quoting Marshall McLuhan from back in the 1960s, the Medium is the message. And when it came to UFOs, we, we learned this new word narrative. You know, I'd like to define that first because I just want to make sure if we're going to d- do a deep dive, what when you say the narr- the UFO narrative, what are we talking about in your mind? In my mind, we're talking control of the subject. Okay. All right, where we are seeing we are seeing uh for the last few years certain people in ufology really disparaging people who have done a lot of work over the last number of years and really trying to take over the entire storyline of ufos right right i mean gone are the days of where we see richard dolan on on uh, major shows or you know you remember stanton friedman a frequent guest on larry king live all the time you You know know, but uh, i you know there's always a nostalgia for the good old days you know uh and i'm i was friends with stan friedman and i have uh two of his books under option and uh, I even wrote, I've got a project where Stan Friedman's a character. It's the Roswell movie we have called The Crash. And it's, uh, but so I have a lot of, you know, bona fides for being, I guess, somebody who cares about him. But I will say this, um, Stan wasn't a constantly evolving analyst, right? If you put Stan on in in uh, 2018 versus Stan in 2015 versus Stan in 2009, you got roughly the same things. You know, you got the sound bites about Cosmic Watergate, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I think that one thing that is good is we have a, a, a bigger collection of individuals who you can frankly put on your show now uh, who are able to speak to an evolving narrative, right? Stan was his own narrative. Right and 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 a and a positive one and and you know he did he, the the ufology owes him a, a big debt of gratitude but there's a lot of people that are busy trying to make sense of what's going on right now and I think they're probably thinking about what you're talking about the narrative what is going on here who's saying what why are they saying it and yet underneath it all for me I mean I'm just speaking for myself here it's like it's all well and good to talk about journalism and the narrative etc cetera, etc. Cetera. I just want to know what is really going on. At the end of the day, if somebody would sort of sit me down and go, hey, um, let me relieve your anxiety. This is who they are. This is where they're from. This is what they want. I would be a happy guy because I just want, I want to answer these questions. I don't want to argue about a lot of things. I just feel like the truth will set us free, good, bad, or indifferent. I want that narrative. And I and I agree with you, but the way we see it being controlled right now, like the DNI report only going back to 2004, sure. or when the To the Stars Academy coming out saying, we're not talking aliens here. We're talking, you know, threat narratives. We're talking, we're right. talking these craft. We don't know where they're coming from. Well, in my opinion, breaking it down, maybe too simplistically. If it's not Russia, it's not China, not anybody on this world, someone is flying that craft. If it's not from here, it's alien. Right. Or it's, well, it's exotic. Uh, I mean, I guess it could be, there's other options besides alien. I guess there are interdimensional options, time travel options, local options. But what I was just going to say about uh, this kind of goes to your journalism and to the narrative, kind of in one little piece here. What I found most disappointing about the um, the June 25th UAP report was not even what was in the report. It was that the 100, nearly 100% of the coverage was about what was in the report, a quick once over, and then it was written on uh, 
June 25th and 26th, and then it faded out. There was almost no analysis. Nobody was analyzing the report. Nobody was you know, doing a deep dive. Nobody said, okay, the report made it sound like it, it was in 2004. Here's an article about everything that happened before that or whatever. Or why did nobody say, okay, if they're seeing Tic Tacs in 2004, when was the first Tic Tac reported? You know, was that in 2004 or was it in 1949? Let's check that out. I mean, I, we, we've got to get people doing a little more analysis is what I think is part of the problem here, because how are you going to know what your narrative is or who's who's twisting the narrative if we if we don't ever sit down and do more than just accept what is spoon fed to us? But, and, and by the way, and one final thing, I'll shut up about this. But, you know, Richard Dolan, you brought him up. Terrific guy. He and I wrote the book AD after disclosure uh, back uh, 10 years ago. So we're celebrating the 10 year anniversary. Happy anniversary, AD. Um of, of that book. And one of the things that Dolan and I said in chapter one, which I thought was really interesting, is that when uh, that disclosure would tend to happen on a Friday afternoon after four o'clock and son of a gun, that's when they dropped the UAP report. Now, that was one of the most specific things I've ever put in a book or an article as far as predictions go. And the reason I did it, because like you, uh, a, a journalism background, I just said, if you're trying to bury something, you put it on Friday afternoon when it's not going to quite get in, and then they're going to have the weekend scrambling. And, and that's exactly what happened. I, I'm smiling here because I had said the exact same thing to our audience, and I had a couple of people, including some some pertinent guests, say, no, 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 that's not going to happen. It's not a Friday afternoon story. And I said, watch, it's coming and out it on was. Friday. And absolutely. I mean, what a, I, I got to tell you, I, I should have called Richard that day. I didn't. I just was, but I was thinking about him. I was just going, man, that is interesting. And 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 that wasn't even disclosure. I mean, that wasn't like the president going to the podium and saying, we are not alone. That was just the report, you know, kind of a, kind of a conservative report of, on the topic. Uh, and they still hid that one. Interesting. So is that part of the narrative discussion? I, I think it is. I, yeah. I, I think it does uh, kind of open up everything that, that kind of goes with the story. I mean, right. let's face it. We mentioned a little bit right uh, in the last part of the last half hour, the media was spoon fed David Fravor. They were spoon fed Luis Elizondo. They were spoon fed Chris Mellon, almost like they were told, this is the story. This is what we got. Right. Follow what we have. You don't need anything more. Yes. Correct. And, and, and the media caught with their pants down on this subject, literally said, okay, we got and, what we need. I mean, even look at the 60 Minutes report. Uh, they didn't really go too far afield. They basically said, we got to just stick with the, the main players here. Let's get Elizondo on. Let's get Mellon on. Let's get Fravor on. And if we can add another pilot or two, particularly if we can get a female pilot on, wouldn't that be great? And now we got a story. But they didn't really do a deeper dive. They didn't come back and do it again. You know, uh, I'm glad they did it. And, 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 and to be honest with you, 60 minutes is going to be doing another article. I mean, another, uh, segment very soon. I'm quite sure because they got so much, so much attention to it that, uh, you know, if, if you're in broadcast news, that's, you crave that. And when you find something that works, what do you do? Do it again. Oh, you follow so, it up. Yeah. But, so we're going to see more of that. But we saw a contradiction to that back in 2017, Bryce, where mm. th that UFO article in the New York Times by Ralph Blumenthal, Helene Cooper, and Leslie Keene had the most purchases and views sure. and reads literally since 9-11. And it was their biggest selling paper since the 9-11 days. And there was no follow-up. I know. So Stories like that always have a follow-up. It's it was so it's nuts. Isn't that, that, that part that, of the narrative nuts. though? The media narrative of not wanting to cover this truthful subject. Yes. However, uh, facts, truth, news has a funny way of forcing writers and citizens and politicians and journalists to have to confront these things sooner or later, even if kicking and screaming. So I, again, tend to be, uh, 
it's it's kind of ironic because uh, I, I guess I would I would go back to AD because what Dolan and I said about disclosure was it was impossible and yet it was inevitable. Okay, and I and I think it is possible to hold those two uh, compartmentalized ideas in your head, and I do to this day. Uh, it is possible to talk about the narrative and say, you know, it's it's just not happening. It's impossible, right? But I believe that the the the, the trunk has been opened enough to let a little light out right now, and you're not going to close it again. It's just going to something's going to happen on top of where we are that is going to unlock it. And frankly, with um, with all the people and all the technology out there, it's it's probably going to happen sooner than later. Okay. So if we go down that line, even yeah. if we push aside the mainstream media here for a second, who is telling the truth out there? Oh. Uh, right? we, have, we have people like Richard Dolan going on and saying what his sources know. I mean, there's a lot of people who love and hate him at the same yeah. time. Yeah. You know, he's still batting the, the Wilson documents. We got Grant Cameron running all over the world, uh, chasing Wu, which is fantastic. We have uh, the, the Debrief, a team like the Debrief. Yeah which is made up of a, bo of, a, of a bunch of amateur journalists who've come together for one cause, and I think they're doing pretty decent. Yeah. We see uh, John Greenwald from the Black Vault using his FOIA request to try and bring some sort of rationality to everything. We have a lot of haters in this field jumping on everybody. I mean, this this field right now is a real mixed bag of, of, of nuclear waste. When it comes it's to very UFO. funny you just said that because while you were talking right before you said mixed bag, I you if I wish you could have seen the thought balloon in my head because I was thinking it's a mixed bag and then you said it so now I'm freaking out but um, yeah it is a really mixed bag and um, I, I guess uh, people tend to do uh, what they've always done they tell their version of the truth so. There are a lot of people telling their version of the truth. They're not necessarily bad people uh, any more than I'm bad or you're bad. We're all trying to tell our version of the truth. And because there's been 75 years of denial and ridicule surrounding this, this topic, uh, the truth is a little harder to get your hands around uh, and your arms around. So it's not as easy as it, it, as it could be or could have been. And uh, it's going to be messy. So yeah, there are, uh, who's telling the truth? Um, some people are probably deliberately not telling the truth, but most people are trying to tell their truth. And the problem is I don't, I mean, I, I guess that's what I'm doing too. And that's what you're doing. But all I can say is uh, when I talk to uh, say, you know, uh, uh, David Bates of the, uh, my, the editor on uh, trail of the saucers, we always just try to say to ourselves, well, what's, you know, how, how do you pursue this with integrity? Right. How, because that's all you've got. I mean, so I, I think going forward, you have to try to take it with integrity. So you mentioned the guys at the debrief who and I agree with you. Uh, they do look like they're trying to take this on with integrity. And and I have to support that and and salute them for it. But is there is there one person out there any at this point today who is just nailing it and and. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I don't well, think I know that person. Well, we seem to have taken turns. And yeah. what I mean is, you know, for the first couple of years, it was all of a sudden Tim McMillan, who's yeah. a great friend of this show, really came out of nowhere, never been a, a writer or a journalist in his life, where all of a sudden he's breaking all of these massive yeah. stories. We've seen that with, with Danny Silva, with the Silver Record. Absolutely. Where Danny, uh, I believe his father was a journalist, and Danny started a blog, and then all of a sudden, because he showed his uh, heartfelt love for TTSA, and I know if he hears this, he's going to smile over that, you know, because we've always kind of agreed to disagree with that. But, you know, he ended up getting and meeting a lot of interesting people. I admire Danny and what yeah, he, he yeah. was. He was very, very, I think he did a great job. He, and I think, uh, uh, and by the way, um, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, there's a lot of people like, you know, James Fox, by the way, I think is someone yes. who I admire and who has done good work, but he kind of moves at a slower pace than the news events are going. So, you know, it took him seven years to get the phenomenon out there. 
And uh, I think we need a little, our fast, our reaction force needs to be a little more fast reaction than that. Uh, let me just give a shout out to somebody who I really enjoy reading. And um, it's Ryan Robbins, who uh, on Twitter is uh, 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 post disclosure. And he's, he's, his persona on YouTube is UFO Jesus. And, and, you know, in a way that that might make him seem kind of fringe or whatever, but I don't read anybody who's got as much clear analysis of the situation as Ryan. I encourage people to read this guy on Twitter uh, because he he's studying it, he's uh, thinking about it, and he's writing original stuff, and I like it. Yeah, and and I think he's done very well. It's nice to see his mature progression. Yes, exactly. I, I still wish he would have gone with UFO Jesus because I think it's a much better name than Post Disclosure, po personally. But, I mean, we've seen George yeah. Knapp. Have well, I think he's Ryan Robbins now. Uh, but, okay, George Knapp. Okay, I have to give the big shout-out to George. I don't know where you come down on that, but I think George Knapp is the best investigative journalist working this story in the country today and has been for a number of years. And if you gave a best UFO investigative reporter award, he'd have won many years in a row because he had the, the, the whole road to himself for the longest time. And um, if anything, uh, he'll probably end up being overexposed because when you're putting on a documentary on this topic, you go, get me nap, <laughs> right? Well, where's the other naps? You know, right now it's like, uh, uh, that UFO uh, documentary on Showtime, you had George Knapp on for, it seemed like eternity. And I love George. I mean, but it was shocking how much they put him on. And Leslie Kane, of course. Um, but there's got to be other people besides the two of them that we can put on TV. Okay. Let me ask you a question about George Knapp, because yeah. over the last six months to 10 months, he has taken a lot of heat. Yes. From from the UFO world and podcasts and and people who believe he's bought that he is part of the entire UFO narrative. He's holding back information. Uh, he we do know he was an investor in the To the Stars Academy. We now see him working very closely with Jeremy Corbell and yeah. you know for some reason the UFO community really hasn't hasn't attached itself to Jeremy Corbell. They no. may. You know, yeah. I mean, so George has become a little bit of a polarizing figure, which it shocks me to be honest, Dave, because I, that guy is not bought. He's an honest, honest man. I mean, I've in my dealings with him, he, he's uh, he's terrifically knowledgeable and he's honest. And he's also, to the extent that people want to fling those arrows at him, what they're really responding to in many cases is George is a, a journalist of the old school who, if he gives you his word, he won't do something. He'll, he'll, he'll protect a source or whatever. He would actually do that. Um, and somebody might think that's withholding, but bot, I don't think so. Okay. I'm, I'm going to give you, and, and I'm saying this, I'm a George yeah. Knapp supporter. Yeah. I, the guy is a legend and I think he needs to be treated as such, but somebody like PBR here, who's yeah. a longtime listener of ours, he says, George Knapp pushed the fake Lazar narrative for 35 years now. And for a lot of people, that is uh, that is all they need to, to bring the hate onto George Knapp. Well, are we supposed to believe that? I mean, I don't, you know what? Again, we got to quit fighting with each other on this, on, on this spe every specific, because uh, there's been a lot of disinformation, denial and ridicule out there for years. The Lazar narrative... I'm just asking you right now. Are you telling me? Is that what you think? Do you think the Lazar me? story is fake? Yeah. Me? No. I and don't I'll, either. And I'll tell I'll tell you why. Take away George Knapp. Take away Bob Lazar. KLAS Channel 8 TV in Las Vegas has never retracted the story. Right. And you and what people who do not understand the behind the scenes of how media works in order to put a story like that on, it's not just let's trot this guy out and see what right. he has to say for a story with those type of accusations that Lazar was making, they would have had to have a nap would have had to have some sort of proof or corroborating evidence outside of John Lear outside of Gene Hoff. Okay. To sit there and say, we need some heavy evidence if we're going to be running this because we could be in trouble. Yeah. And, and this story likely went to the team of lawyers 
yeah. before going out. And that's why I believe the story of Bob Lazar. Now, there may be factual evidence that is wrong because of what has happened over time where he was arrested for being involved in a, in a brothel and mm -hmm. some other, uh, you know, his education that has never been proved, which Knapp has, has, has stated. But I think George Knapp takes the brunt of that. Yeah, you know, um, okay, I see, I see where you're coming from there, and I, and I, I, I think I uh, uh, agree. Uh, and the only thing I would add is that, okay, um, our solidarity for the truth should not rise or fall on specific cases. You know, you have to look at the totality of each individual. You know, I wouldn't want someone looking at me and saying, well, you know, I saw he said this about Betty and Barney and I disagree with that. Therefore, I can't believe anything the guy has to say about anything. I just don't think that's how it works because we live in a world where this has the, been the most highly classified, most disinformed, um, most denied and most ridiculed topic in world history. Okay, so... Yes, there's going to be disagreements because no one has made this easy to get to a place where we can agree on, to go back to your phrase, what the narrative is, right? Um, there are different narratives by design. Whoever's sitting on top, I, I don't know that there is somebody out there who literally knows the entire truth and nothing but the truth, but I do think there are people in either private enterprise or government or whatever, I do think there are people who know more than I do. All right. I know what I know. I've done the best I could, but I would imagine there are some people who have a pretty good theory about what is going on. And I wish those people would talk. I think it's time. I think it's time too, but it seems like we keep getting these turns. So, yes. you know, like throughout this year, it's been the Jeremy Corbell year. Yeah. With the videos. Okay. And I have talked to some people on the inside who don't even know where Jeremy Corbell is getting these, this information from. Correct. Obviously he's become Knapp's uh, working right. dog. And yeah. I mean that politely. Yeah, okay. I, I agree. You know, so, I mean, is it, is it about taking turns to try and bring in different people? Because I remember George saying that he had, as we got about a minute ago, sure. he, he knew about the three videos eight months before the New York Times video came out, but he was told by certain people, this isn't your story. This has to go to the New York Times. Yeah. And, and he yes. bit his tongue on it. Uh, he didn't want to. But he knew that if he if he if he didn't bite his tongue, he burnt the bridge, and there goes the story. Burnt the bridge, but I, you know, I talked to George about that personally, and one of the it wasn't just um, him taking orders from somebody. It, it, from George's point of view, he too sort of agreed it's more of a game changer if the New York Times does it than uh, George Knapp at a television station in Las Vegas, and right. I think he took a bullet for the cause. Um, at that point, or at least that's how I've seen it. Um, I, you know, others may disagree, um, but uh, uh, it had to break his heart. I mean, he's a reporter. I mean, can you imagine knowing about those videos and sitting on them? Yeah, I, that's terrible. That's I, I grind my teeth. I'm, I'm yeah. surprised. George is probably pretty glad that he has a dental plan. Yeah. His teeth <laughs> that way. Bryce, I'm going to get you to hold yeah. on. We are going to take a break here at the top of the hour. The UFO narrative continues with journalist Bryce Zabel here on Space Down Radio as we enter hour two. Oh, man, this is a great heated discussion. We're getting into some real good stuff coming up next on the Mighty SOR. So stay tuned. All right, we're clear. That was a power half hour there, man. <laughs> it's just, it's flying. It's fun. Oh, wow. I mean, uh, because these are things that um, we all know that we live in historical times and we're all trying to make sense of it and we all have opinions. Um, and, uh, you know, I just wish the time would come where we would stop having to try to try to find the story and instead try to process it. That would be. To me, well, that will be the day. I, I understand the anger of the listeners. They're done. Yeah. 
they're done with experiencers. They're done with the games. And I understand like, like our, our listener PBR who he, you know what? He's here almost every night listening and he is one of my biggest critics. But the reason why I like him is because he's not afraid to call out what he feels is what right. is his opinion. Then what is it that he's uh, what, what is his disagreement with you and your show then? Oh, he doesn't, he, he thinks I'm too easy on people. Oh, he thinks well, I'm too easy on people. You're a nice you're a nice man. There's nothing wrong with that. And and by the way, uh, I don't think you take it too easy on people. When you, uh, we've had several conversations where you state your mind clearly. So I, you know, I, I think that we also have to, you know, you have to be in there for the long haul. If you're going to have viewers and listeners. You got to, you can't just anger yep. everybody every night. You know, but but what we see now is we do see an influx of podcasts and radio yeah. shows, YouTube channels that are and and blogs that especially UFO Twitter that will do anything to tear people apart. I mean, they will do and say anything. I mean, it is it is. Uh, I hate that. I just hate it. I hate it. Yeah, I just I, it just makes my skin crawl when I see and hear that stuff. Mm hmm. So, I mean, but you, you ha also have to say, look, I don't like it either. I've been at, you know, I've been attacked. I, other people have been yeah. attacked, you know, and, and it's just like, okay, where is this coming from? And people are pissed off. Yeah. They're, they're tired of the runaround. Let's get to it. We've had more information out there than, than in any time in history. And yeah. I, 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 you know, you said, bingo, I hope when we come back that, what you just said, we say again, because I do think that that is part of what's going on. I feel it in my bones. You feel it. Your listeners feel it. We People that have taken the time to even get marginally up to speed on this topic get frustrated because they say, what will it take? How much longer must this go on? And it's so irritating. Absolutely. We can hit that when we come back because yeah. I think that's, that's a good angle to, to hit. So, I mean, I'll just shut up about that right now so we don't waste anything okay. uh, during the break here, yeah. you know, but uh, no, this is fantastic conversation. I really do believe though, uh, as much as I love George Knapp, yeah. I, I really, really have a strong feeling that Ross Coltart's going to be the man who breaks it. I really do. He's going to, somebody down there is going to just all of a sudden talk to him. And uh, Ross is, um, I've spent a, some private conversations with Ross. Yeah. Um, because I'm, I'm, um, I guess I feel like a kindred spirit to the guy. I know what he's going through. I know where he's coming yeah. from yeah. and I know where he is in the process. And I suspect that you're feeling the same way. And that's interesting that you say it. Because I got to say, man, that's exactly what I feel. I feel if anybody's going to be that guy, uh, it'll have to be an outsider like Ross, who's now moved outside the system to do this. Yeah. And because the guys in the system, the Leslie's and the Ralph's, aren't getting the job done right now. And it may be because they don't want to, or it may be because the New York Times won't let them or I whatever. Think that's it. I think that's it, yeah. which is stupid for the New York Times on a business level because it's selling papers. Yeah. I oh, mean, my God. Yeah. This is, I mean, the, the sheer idiocy. And it's funny because every time a television show, whether it's Fox News, CNN, uh, it doesn't matter. Not these idiotic documentaries that are have the same people on every same UFO show. Oh, I know. You know, but I mean, we're talking real outlets here. Their numbers spike huge when you, they talk UFOs. Yeah, they spike, and we're not talking a couple hundred thousand people. We're talking a couple million people per yeah. time. I know, and, and it, it's obviously a money maker. Yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's what's frustrating. You know, if I write a um, a very well received uh, article. Uh, the the most I'll probably get is like thirty five thousand reads, which is a lot. Okay, but it ain't New York Times numbers. The numbers they're putting on the board are pretty big, and I wish they would use their their ability to command the public's attention a little more aggressively, even than what they're doing. Right. 
but they're not. So. We've got about 45 seconds here. All right. I want to look up something here. Hey, Alien Critter, I, I'm trying to push my radio station in, in Mississauga, Ontario, to get Justin Trudeau on because I know he's been read in. I know he's been read in. Yeah, well, what do you? I, okay, hold the phone. How do you I'll, know that? Uh, I'll tell you at the next break. How about that? Okay. All right. Big thank you to Lori, to Snakes on a UFO, and Cat Chaser for the amazing super chats. It's a great way to support what we do on a nightly basis here on Spaced Out Radio. Thank you to all the veterans who are listening to this show and to every one of our regulars who are here nightly. We love you. Get your horns up. Bumblefoot's coming right now. You're listening to Spaced Out Radio with Dave Scott. Follow Dave on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Facebook, Spaced Out Radio Show. Hour number two of Spaced Out Radio is underway. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate earning your listening ears wherever you are on this beautiful planet we call Earth. Want to say hello to everyone tuning us in on our terrestrial affiliates around North America and digitally on TalkStream Live, Revolution Radio, and KPNL. All of our archives are free by going to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Radio Goniometer. Yeah, I'm only saying that once as the clam sets a password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website, spacedoutradio.com, we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio, and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. From Trails of the Saucers on Medium, we have journalist Bryce Zabel with us talking UFOs and the narrative all night long. And, and Bryce, I'm going to work in an audience question here from sure. Marie down in Los Angeles. She She's wondering if you've seen the film The 11th Green. She has many questions to the government after watching this film just the other night, called it a real cerebral movie. You know, uh, I just saw that pop up on your screen and I was... I'm sitting here going, I wanted to write her and, and, and respond to it. But the last time I tried to do that, I ended up popping off the, your screen. So I'm not doing that. But Marie, great question. Uh, I just saw it myself a month ago. Uh, I, I really enjoyed it. And, and, you know, I think you probably know that I'm the uh, creator of the Dark Skies show. And I found it to be very Dark Skiesian is how we, you know, how I, I would describe it. Because it's, it's weaving that... Um, the, you know the history and 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 portraying real people in this case Eisenhower and Obama and all that which is what uh, Dark Skies tried very much to do. So yeah, I liked it and I I I, I liked it a lot. Uh, I thought they accomplished a lot for probably not very much money. I think Campbell Scott is uh, one of the more interesting actors uh, of his generation. I enjoyed seeing that and um, what I thought uh, I don't. I can't remember who wrote it, and I, I don't know that I know them anyway. Um, but I did find it to be extremely informed about ufological events, which is uh, from history, and to weave them kind of seamlessly into its narrative. So I really enjoyed it, and I would recommend it for people. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be 100% true to be a good film. And if you know your uf ufological history, folks, this is a good one to watch. The 11th wow. Green, which is a kind of a weird title, uh, which has to do with the golf course that Eisenhower's property is looking over, I think, is what the reference is. And But check it out. It's pretty good. I, I got it on Amazon, I think. All right. Well, I appreciate that. Bryce, one of the things we are seeing in the field of ufology these days is not so much from all from all the people that are now involved and have broken this subject down to quite a minute detail. Yeah. But we're seeing a lot of anger. I see it in our chat rooms on a nightly basis from our listeners. They're done with the stories. They're done with the narratives. They're done with cover-ups. They're done with the experiencers, anecdotal evidence. They're just done. And after 70 plus years of this happening, I don't blame the audience or, or the people who love this subject getting fed up with another experiencer's story, another, another uh, 
blip on a YouTube video that is supposed to be a UFO, uh, you know, a video of a UFO then being told that there were 14 others before this flying around. I mean, we see it all the time. Wh what do you think of this frustration that is happening with people who want this subject to be done? Let's either crap or get off the pot when it comes to disclosure. I'm angry. I'm really pissed off. I'm frustrated. It's like Bill Clinton said, I feel your pain. I, I'm not happy. I'm not a happy camper. Um, and I've gotten more angry, uh, every year. And I'm probably as angry as I've ever been right now. So I get it. Um, I'm not as young as I used to be, right? None of us are. But I remember, you know, when I first came to Hollywood, I was the youngest guy in every room. And that's not true anymore, right? I would like to shuffle off this planet of ours at a time when I at least know what is going on. And I am getting increasingly frustrated by that. And by the way, uh, on the experiencer thing, not to open up a sore point or to pick a fight with anybody, but, um, you know, I'm a speaker at the IUFOC uh, on sa Sunday uh, the 12th. Yeah, Sunday the 12th. So last night I was watching Lou Elizondo on, um, uh, on uh, do his speech uh, for opening night, and he had a flash of anger. And it was interesting to me because he's such a, you know, calm kind of guy who's learned how to measure and meter out his speech, but he's a little irritated about the whole experiencer thing. Cause he's saying it's not data. You know, we can blow this thing open with data right now. And, and why aren't we? And, and, you know, I got to tell you the whole conversation would be over if, if j just take those three freaking videos that we've seen little snippets of I understand that they've shown pretty much the full thing to various congressmen and senators in briefings, you know, the more HD versions that go on for 40 minutes and they're blowing people's minds. Why can't we see those? I mean, let's just get this thing on the road. So yeah, for you are right. Your, your listeners have, uh, and, and viewers have every reason to be upset the only thing that we can't do right now is we got them where we want them. It's on topic now. It's okay to talk about it. And we need to push. We need to push like activists do. I mean, people didn't turn away from the civil rights movement and say, yeah, it's kind of hard and I'm a little frustrated. We don't have our rights yet. They just said they doubled down. Well, we got to double down right now. I guess that's it. But how do you double down against a government that is holding these national secrets and we don't, you don't have, you don't double. I mean, look, you're not going to take the government on, but you know what? It only takes a whistleblower or it takes somebody leaking some of those videos or it takes a deathbed confession or, you know, I mean, I don't know. I, you know, Dolan and I played this game for, for a year trying to, while we were writing AD, I mean, for all, for all that, 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 uh, you know, what would happen if, as an example, Colin Powell is on his deathbed and he goes, I'm tired of holding this secret. And he lays out what he knows. Well, that would get the ball rolling. So somebody is available to do that. And you talked about our friend Ross uh, Coltheart, and um, he's talking to some pretty heavyweight people and putting two and two together. And some of these people are coming at him with some really phenomenal information. And I think he's just taking his time sifting through some of it right now. We may be getting answers from a lot of different uh, fronts soon, and I hope that's true. My only concern about Ross Coulthard, and, I, and, I, and this is nothing that I haven't told him yeah. in private conversations, and you and I, you know, for the record, had this same private conversation. Sure. I really hope that he watches whom he speaks to and oh. whom he aligns himself with because this field is so filled with arrogance at times. It is filled with people who are pushing their own agenda and their own brand and value that they're not worried about the truth. They're worried about what is in this for me. And Ross yeah. doesn't seem to be coming at it from that angle. 
And I really hope that he does a lot of his homework as he goes through this, this maze of ufology to realize that there's a lot of shysters out there who have zero interest in Ross Coltart or the narrative. They're wondering how they can be a leech and tag along so that way their name is included in that uh, phenomena, whatever story he breaks. Well, that's... You know, that goes with the territory, but I'll tell you something. In my conversations with the man, I think he's one of the smartest, you know, cookies I've talked to. And I don't think you pull one over on this guy. You know, I think he's what he's what's interesting about his style, he's disarming because he's a charming Aussie, right? And uh I you know, you're Canadian, I'm American, but Americans like the Aussies. We we we, Same we as think we, we like them. They're and, part of the Commonwealth. Right, and I I like uh, I like where he's coming from, and I think, uh, but it it doesn't the fact that he's uh, a nice guy to talk to doesn't mean that he's not thinking very carefully about what people are telling him and why they're telling him. He just keeps it kind of close to the chest here, and and I I, I look for him to, as you said, break a few big stories in the future. Yeah, I'm very much uh, looking forward to it. I, I really am seeing where he goes. But the public's eyes on this and the frustration that the public ha has for this topic, they don't know where the news is coming from. What they do know through all of this, if anything, is you can't trust the U.S. military or what comes out of the Pentagon. Because now, after years of ufology saying we can't trust the spooks. We can't trust right. Washington. Now, all of a sudden, all the spooks are coming out saying, trust us. Yeah, I agree. I mean, uh, that's weird. By the way, I see on your screen, Fat Bass is asking, what if China disclosed first? Which is a great question. Dolan and I kicked that around. for. And, and let's face it, you could have a disclosure race because if the United States intelligence community got word that, say, either Putin or China was about to go first. And then we would have to ask ourselves whether it was good or bad for them to go first. And we might want to scoop them or, and by the way, it doesn't have to be a nation. It could, well, I guess the Vatican is a nation, but it could be the Vatican. It could be the Pope. It could be, you know, other, other figures. And I don't know that China has the motivation to go first. I think, I think I'd buy Putin going before China, to be honest with you. But I, but I don't know. But I do. You know, Brazil could make a statement, but it wouldn't be as important if if the big three went first. That would be cool, and it would get things going. Should the you mentioned that you're very much siding with the public on this, and you understand yeah. their frustration? I mean, where do they find a straight answer now? I mean, we have a field that yeah. is that is just filled with with a lot of, how can I put rhetoric? That yeah. is a lot of rehashing of stories, whether it's on UFO Twitter, whether it's on shows like this. I mean, you, and, and you can even admit, because you, you yeah. watch, I mean, even a lot of podcasts and YouTube channels out there now are starting to get very foul and rude towards people in the community because they've had enough as well. Yeah. Um, and you know what? I don't want to become one of those guys that just rehashes his old favorite stories from podcast to podcast. I actually took a year off. That's probably why we haven't seen each other. I just said, I need to do a little more think interior than I need to be speaking. So I took a year off to think more than speak. Um, I did my speaking in, in the trail of the saucers as, as magazine articles. Um, I think there is a danger to that where we we sort of become our own echo chamber. And I think echo chamber is a really valid concept for what ufology has always been in danger of becoming, where we tell ourselves the same stories. We've got to reach out to other people. We've got to bring other people in. That's why when you know I saw Ross Ross's book in plain sight, I thought, well, this is good because he's not I didn't I didn't know who this guy was when I read it. And I, I, it was nice to have a fresh voice. We've got to get the fresh voices in there. We've got to stop just saying the same old things, the same old ways. And we have to progress this discussion in a, in a frankly, a, a profound way right now, because you know, the planet's falling apart, right? I, I, it, it's uh, the, one of the 
uh, articles I wrote most recently that got a lot of traction was something called Code Red for UFO disclosure, because we're at Code Red on the planet. What does that mean? I mean, the, the, the planet is losing its ability to sustain us. At the same time, we're still grappling with this nonsense about whether we're going to tell ourselves what's really going on with the UFO issue. That is incompatible with our best interests. Now, that's what scares me because I think it is possible that the reason it's been so difficult and continues to be so difficult if, is that the truth, such as, you know, I put truth in quotes because it, it, it's obviously a tough thing to, to figure out exactly, but maybe it's not good news. You know, maybe it's not sweetness and light. Maybe, maybe you know, and, and, and you can look at anything, any of these things, and look at it from both points of view. Let's take the fact that they're seen near nuclear uh, weapons from time to time. And, and more often than we'd like to believe. Okay, if you're a pro uh, Stephen Greer kind of guy, you would say, well, that's because they want to save us from ourselves, right? They, they want to lead us away from these warlike ways. All right, well, that's one interpretation. But the other could be, I mean, I'm a little concerned if somebody's looking at nuclear weapons and turning them off and on. I mean, I don't think that's probably uh, designed to to create um, confidence in in you know in our even the security of our weapons. So I, I don't know. I just am concerned that the news might be a little bad. Well, but here's the thing. I mean, we have people like Dr. Stephen Greer charging thousands of dollars for these CE5 contact yeah. stories. We see people coming out of the blue, whether it's Demi Lovato or somebody along that line, right. all of a sudden posing as ufologists. Uh. You know, I mean, look, Demi Lovato has in total over 104 million followers on our social media platforms. That is good for the subject. But yeah. is the content there? Should she be the voice? Should it not be some veteran ufologist leading her around so she can learn about it rather than being the star of the show? And this is where a lot of people in ufology and even outside of ufology look, oh, man, really? Demi the Lovato? Just, now? You know what? It's like I don't need Rob Lowe to explain UFOs to me. I don't need Demi Lovato to explain UFOs to me. And, and you know, listen, I'm a child of Hollywood. I mean, at least for the last three decades. And uh, it it still makes me want to tear my fists out of the ceiling when I, I hear, oh, there's going to be a new UFO show. And we've got Demi Lovato to host it. I It just makes me go, we're, we're doing this the wrong way. I, you know, a better model for a show and something that I may put some energy into would be, I don't know how many people watch the show, The Circus on Showtime, but it's four journalists on a weekly basis, sort of, you know, kicking around what's going on, but not in a meet the press kind of way, but in kind of a hipper way. I, why isn't there a show like The Circus done for UFOs where, where you, because th there's enough new stuff coming out all the time and there's enough historical stuff. Why do we, why can't we have our own shows now? Why do they have to be podcasts? Uh, you know, why can't they also be in the, in the sort of the, the broadcast cable satellite world where they get a lot of traction. So I, th I think we've got to move forward in a lot of different ways. And that's one of them. Well, I mean, we can move forward, but I mean, how do you get people to take it seriously? You know, I mean, is this where somebody like Knapp has to start hosting something like Robert Stack did with Unknown Mysteries, you know? You no, know, no, I don't think so, because that would feel like a lot of the same. Uh, I mean, we've seen that, right? We have seen that. What we have to see is the the ufo slash uap version of some other kind of shows like you know nobody thinks twice that there's a meet the press on every week talking about the the events of the last week why isn't there a ufo show like that not aimed at the already converted but aimed at the large population well it's going to happen eventually um it, but i don't think we should wait for full-on disclosure before it happens. It's got to happen now. Now, it's interesting because I will tell you this. Uh, I think those shows are waiting to happen and that kind of um, 
knowledge is waiting to happen. When I was doing Dark Skies, uh, we had kind of a, um, uh, it was wild because a lot of the people that were my executives at the studio and the network on that show went on to run networks and some of them are still running networks. And, the, you know, at the time we were doing Dark Skies, it was more like, well, you know, you guys are a little bit crazy, uh, me and my partner, Brent Freeman. And, you know, if you want to go do that, it's great. I mean, maybe we'll get an audience. But they were smart people. And I, I bet today, if if I were to run into them in the, in the grocery store in Brentwood or something, they'd say, hey, man, I've been reading all this stuff about UFOs. And, you know, what's going on? They would ask me right now what's going on, right? So I think we should you know, we, we need to take advantage of that. I see someone likes my poofy hair. I'm sorry. I don't know what to do. I, uh, I could get a hat. Um, no, no, your, your hair looks great. <laughs> your hair looks great. <laughs> but you know, um, I, I just, uh, we're not there yet, but we, we stand at the precipice of being there. I think I, I really do. Think okay. That. So if you were to do a show like the circus yeah, or, or uh, yeah. I hate to use the Canadian version, we call the W five up here. All right. How, okay. Who would be on your team? Who would be oh, your personal? Well, there's a tendency to go to the usual suspects, right? And I think it would be better to do some of the non-usual suspects or at least to mix it up. So I guess what I'd want to do, um, I'd want to have a couple of people that are on every week that so that because people like characters, right? I mean, whether it's a drama series or a news series, people like you know, why do we watch? We watch because we like these people and we, we want to hear what they have to say. So I think you'd, would it be Demi Lovato? Not in my world. It wouldn't, it would be certainly lovely, intellectually interesting and compelling people. And then I'd have people cycling through it as well. So you get different voices. And so could George Knapp come through? Absolutely. Would he be the host? Probably not at this point, because I think you're, you're kind of looking for a, you're, you're, you're just looking for a more edgy vibe, you know, we're, 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 I think it's, but edgy in a smart way, not edgy in a, let's go get Rob Lowe and his kids to drive around the country in a van and do UFOs. That's not what I'm looking to do. But well, we saw that also with Ozzy and his kids. Yeah. Oh, by the way, oh, this is a great story then. So I got asked to do Ozzy, not, well, not Ozzy, but his kid. Uh, what's his, uh, Jack. Uh, Jack. Yes. Okay. So I was asked to analyze something for Jack Osborne and his gang of stoners who were sitting on their couches, right? And I look at this thing and I thought right away, okay, that's not a UFO. It's just some video of people going, oh man, look at that. That's really wild. I call up my friend, Ben Hansen. I say, I want to send this to you. And we talk about it and he goes, oh, those are guys on in parachutes with their flares. That's how those things are done, right? So I'm about to go on and I say to the producer as I'm waiting, you know, um, I think I can tell you how that video was made, et cetera, et cetera. There's a long pause. And, and she says, um, we don't want you to do that. You know, our people already believe in UFOs. So they don't want, we're not, you're not being asked on to tell us that that's not a good video. You're, you're here to just tell us that it's a great video. And I thought, this is like, this is wrong. You know, uh, so so I do think we have some work to do. You know, if we're going to if we're going to try to to we, we need honest appraisals of everything. Absolutely. And Bryce, I'm going to get you to hold on right there. Yeah. Hard to believe we're already halfway through tonight's show. Oh, we man. have we have Bryce Zabel for another half hour here on Spaced Out Radio. Coming up next is UFO Twitter and the Internet of Ufology. The best or worst thing that has ever happened to the UFO field. <laughs> There's we'll a good question. From Bryce Sable, right after this, on the Mighty SOR. Might as well fire it right up, but we're already here. Yeah, we're rocking and rolling here right now. And this is flying by. This is a great show tonight. Great show. I don't even know how much time you do. How much do you do every night? I do three hours a night. Oh, do you really? Yeah. That must just crush you sometimes. There are days. There are days. Uh, last week was a really hard week. I have to really, really watch my schedule. 
Yeah. Um, like for instance, I, you know, there are times when it's after the show, after I've edited the show for our radio stations and everything like that, where all of a sudden I'll, I'll take a phone call and I'm on the phone until two, three in the morning. Yeah. And then I still have my daytime job. I have to go to as well. Yeah. And, and there are times where I, I don't even know what your daytime job is. What is your day? I work, I work in financing. All right. Yeah. So, um, it, it's, it's tough that, um, sometimes I need to, uh, I can screw myself up for the week. Uh, Ben from UFO garage says your hair and beard are epic. <laughs> See, I'm not quite, I think I, a uh, part of me wants to thank, uh, UFO garage. And part of me wants to say, uh, what exactly do you mean by that? So no, I, uh, no, no, no. If, you, if you saw Ben and Joe, yeah. If, if you saw Ben and Joe is he's got hair down to here braided and a beard just as okay. long. Yeah. And, and Ben, two of the great honestly, you would have a lot of fun with them on their podcast. We highly, highly support Ben and Joe. Excellent. From, from UFO Garage. There's not a I'll lot tell you of one thing I will tell you uh, anybody who's making a co- I'm just had it happy at my age to have hair, so I like to show it off. I've still got hair, and I like that. That's a good thing. Yeah. Well, you know what? They're actually, uh, I had Lou Elizondo on, oh, a couple months ago. And I let, I I fired Lou up a little bit. I got him mad on the air. Oh, what, what did you get him mad about? Uh, No, I just let him release. I, I like my first question to him was, I said, Lou, you look tired and, and you know, how is this on your wife and kids? Oh. And that's what started it. And I just, I played, you know, as a journalist, you, okay, we got something here. We got to keep going. We got to keep going. And that's what we did. And then the next day, Lou was scheduled for an hour with Ben and Joe from UFO Garage. And I and I had told him, I said, I, I said Lou, you're going to have just a great time with these guys and, and just be prepared for a lot of fun have fun, enjoy them. And Lou ended up staying for like two and a half hours with them. Yeah. He was having such a blast talking everything from beards to, to cars and, and UFOs. I mean, Ben and Joe did just a, a fantastic job with that. Fantastic job. So ben, that That's Ben and Joe, our UFO garage. Yeah. Yeah. Hey yeah. guys, I hope you're listening. Thank you. Good luck with your podcast. Yeah. No, you, you would uh, check them out. Yeah, they're, yeah, I will. They're, they're a growing audience, and uh, and uh, Ben actually is a is uh, the guy who's creating our brand new look website, which will launch next Monday. So uh, that's what he does for his daytime job, and so uh, he is uh, working extra hard here because he's about to become a first time father at the end of the month, oh. and uh, so he's like racing around trying to get everything done beforehand. But uh, we love Ben and Joe around here. They're they're high quality people, high quality people. I got to meet them a couple of years ago. I knew nothing of them. And then I got to meet them a couple of years ago, thanks to Lori and Fenton, because uh, they were uh, podcasting at uh, UFO con in San Francisco. And then just seeing these guys, uh, I mean, they don't take themselves too seriously. Uh, the only gripe I have, like Chad Smith says here, is they're only on once a week. <laughs> That's the only thing that bugs me about their show is that it's yeah. once a week. It's hard to do nightly. Oh, yeah. I mean, boy, that's a commitment. You know what, though? I have nothing better to do in my life, man. <laughs> I, well, that's everybody in my house has been asleep for an hour and a half. What am I what am I supposed to do? I, I could be doing I could be flipping through the channels uh, for hours upon end, or I could have some fun and talk about subjects I love. I think it's really cool. And, and you know, I admire it because I know um, I like, you know, look, I enjoy doing on air things and it's, it's, uh, it's interesting to me, but I can't say that it's without, without a price. Each one of them, you have to sort of get yourself up for, right. You, you can't, you can't phone it in. You gotta, you gotta wake up. You gotta get your head in the game. Um, you gotta be prepared. Otherwise you end up saying things you don't even mean because you're just filling the air. That's the only part where I, I get into trouble sometimes in, in the later part of an interview where I'm just, you know, I'm just kind of sagging a little bit and then I'm just filling time and I got to keep 
which I'm doing now. I'm just hold on, hold on, boss, because we're gonna get going right here. Let's do this. We pass the halfway point of Spaced Out Radio tonight. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for being here. Really appreciate earning your listening ears. Want to remind you that if you've missed portions of this show or others, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com where we have a plethora of features for you including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. We continue on with the UFO narrative tonight on the show. Our guest tonight from Medium Trail of the Saucers, journalist Bryce Zabel. And Bryce, we're going to get right into the internet here. Yeah. Has the internet been beneficial or more of a detractor to what's really happening in ufology. I think it's great that we see on YouTube hundreds, if not thousands of UFO channels. You know, I mean, everything from people trying to do their best work to people who are putting up a bunch of CGI and fake films for clickbait and getting the momentum on building their channels from there. We see a lot of podcasts. There's literally in North America alone, I believe about about 4,000 podcasts on everything from UFOs to ET contact. And we haven't even got into the paranormal or Bigfoot or anything like that. You know, then we have the monster known as UFO Twitter, where yeah. there's a lot of angst and anger. And basically, if you say anything against Tom DeLong or the two, the stars Academy, you're going to get shredded to bits. I mean, has the internet been a good move for trying to push ufology forward? I mean, when you were starting to phrase the question is, has it been a good thing or is it a bad thing? I was going to answer yes. I mean, because the, the answer is it's both and it's always both simultaneously. Uh, for my own benefit, though, I have to say it's too much. I can't keep up with it. I just, it's too much. I can't watch all the YouTubes. I can't listen to every podcast. I can't read all the tweets. I can't absorb all the information. It's too much. And so uh, I do think uh, it is still important to have people sort of curating some of the better stuff because I don't want to waste my time trying to figure out what's right and what's wrong. And, it, you know, I, I, I need a little help as a, as a listener, as a viewer or whatever. Um, however, having said that, I don't, you know, yes, if you if you tweet about something, you might get trashed, and I've certainly been trashed by people. And you know, I guess I guess that's part, goes with the the business. Uh, for me, though, it's just I I I think I'd like some of the bigger uh, established names of media to get in this game because they're sort of they have the resources to throw at some of these things to pre-vet them. I just can't keep up. I keep running into people who say, Hey, have you heard this show? Or did you see that video? Or do you follow this guy? And I, my answer is I no. I guess I, I, I guess I missed it. You know, it's just too much. Yeah. I, I, and, and you know, not to sound insulting, I get hit with those daily, daily. And yep. you feel bad you know, that you can't get to them all. You you, you, but you can't. You know, I talk to people like um, uh, Dolan and, and uh, Coltart, um, and, you know, these are people with thousands of emails in their box. How do they get to them all? I, I can't. It's not that I don't want to talk to people. I just can't. I can't deal with 3,000 emails in a day. Who does that? I, you know, it's just too much for me personally. And, um so uh, particularly when you're trying to sort of create some of your own content too, uh, we've turned the whole world into content creators and that's okay. Uh, but not if you're creating fake content and passing it off as true content. I don't like that. I'm not a fa fan of anybody doing that. And I wish they would stop. 
And I think that's a fair assessment of everything. But now that there's money on the line yeah. with social media and, and YouTube channels and, and, you know, hey, we're broadcasting live on YouTube right now as we speak, let alone terrestrial radio. I mean, you have no choice if you are a business. You have right. to get the message out there. I mean, me being a radio guy, I understand that I have a face for radio and a voice for print. But I have no ch I have no choice but to go on right. YouTube in order to make what radio stations aren't picking up. It's funny because television has learned there's a lot of money in UFOs. Yes. Newspapers have learned, for the most part, there's a lot of money in UFOs. But here's the problem. Um, I'm a a guest expert. I'm not I'm not supposed to talk about the program yet, but I'm a guest expert on two documentaries that are coming up. And yet on both of those documentaries, I knew things that sort of should have been said in the documentary because they're, they're factual parts of that. And yet they didn't want them in the documentaries because they said, no, oh, the audience already believes all this and you, we just want to give them what they, what they want. So TV may have discovered UFOs, but it doesn't mean they're all looking at them journalistically and which is, which True. is too bad. Um, True. Yeah. And now, and by the way, just to harken back to something we talked about earlier, one of the reasons something like the debrief is a good thing is that if you like Tim and, and the and the gang and you, you, you sort of have the feeling that they are uh, curating and they are sifting through information and that at least what the things they're writing about, they put some time into it. And I, I like that because it makes me feel better about reading it you know and the fact is let's get back to your comment here yeah. because uh, so solaire makes a comment in our chat room it's true that everyone has become a content creator and it's muddied the waters yeah, so exactly. how does somebody who is looking from the outside in on this subject find those clear waters where they're getting proper information and not just a one-sided narrative that this is the way it is if you don't believe me you're getting wrong information I don't know. Uh, I, I, I don't know. I, how do I do it personally? I, I have to go to people that I've, I know and trust and I have kind of my own hierarchy of people. So, you know, maybe some of your people would disagree that I shouldn't be paying attention to George Knapp, for example, but I found him to be a reliable source. So I listen to him. Um, I, I, I can't keep up with everything. And there's always somebody who knows more than I do about something, uh, particularly a case or something. Um, I've, I found that the internet is a pretty poor way to try to, re you know, I was trying to get up to speed on say the Travis Walton case uh, a month, a couple, three months ago. And there, there just wasn't a really good source for it. There's a lot of people, you know, on the internet throwing out their views of it that you had to sift through. And it was sort of, it wasn't presented well, a lot of it. And then you had Travis's book. There wasn't that that other piece of content that somebody had put out. So I try to write the things that I can't find, I guess is what I do. But it's, it's hard. It's just hard. But Travis Walton is a good example right now yeah. of the UFO community trying to tear down this man as a liar. Yeah. Because uh, Mike... Rogers, who is his yep. former brother-in-law, went off on off the deep end about some business deal that seemed to not go through between the yeah. two. It came down to finances. And now all of a sudden, Travis Walton's a liar. He's a fake. He has never told the truth about this subject. I mean, are we eating our own for yes. no reason? Well, but yeah, the one thing I will say that I enjoyed most about working with Richard Dolan is he's a historian right? My father was a history teacher. I consider myself uh, as much a historian as a journalist, as an entertain, as a dramatist, I guess. And what the problem you're, you're referring to is not a new one, right? Eating our own. I mean, ufology has been eating their own since the forties. I mean, it, it, this is just the way it is. Um, and it's except like everything, like everything else, it's been accelerated by the internet. And what's going on with Travis right now, uh, you, you, you've got to consider the sources. Mike Rogers, for example, um, just to even look at his comments, 
you have to question what, where he's coming from. You know, just just as a judge of judge of character, you have to be really careful about that. I don't happen to look. Um, I'm not going to say that Travis Walton is the perfect case. It's not. It's a good case. I was involved in it. I, I mean, I I was a radio reporter when it was happening, and I I remember my audience loved anything I could throw out about it. I don't know about it, but I do think we have to. Um, you know, we have to always be ready to, as your person here, how do you know if someone is a hoaxer? Well, the truth of the matter is that's something that's a big problem. You know, people want to be popular. They want to get some uh, uh, eyeballs on them or their work, and they hoax. Hoaxing is bad. Don't hoax. You know, and when you see someone who is clearly hoaxed, you have to call it out. But boy, I think you're right. There is a lot of just nastiness out there, and I don't like it. And and that's the big point. I mean, we're not just out to say this person's a liar, this person's a fake anymore. There are many people out there, whether it's UFO Twitter, YouTube, wherever, who are just out to seek and destroy. I Let mean, me ask you a question, though, because yeah. this is also interesting to me, but let's go back to the narrative thing, right? Sure. What should the narrative be? I mean, what, what are we really saying here? What, what is the UFO narrative right now? And what should it be, though? What should be happening? I think in a perfect world, if, if journalists could be leading this story, yeah. if we did proper investigation into it, the fact that we haven't had a lot of investigative journalists outside of Ross Coltart, outside of of George Knapp, I think has caused a lot of troubles. Uh, yeah. I think that even with the New York Times, you know, not pushing the 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 story forward, it creates a, lo a lot of loopholes. I'm disappointed to see that there has been no counterpoint in the story because we've seen a lot of points, whether it's David Fravor, Alex Dietrich, or Lou Elizondo and Chris Mellon, but we haven't seen a lot of counterpoints that journalism is favored for. When I went to school, I mean, now back in my day, you know, right. I was always taught that every story should have a point and a counterpoint to it. Yeah. And let the, uh, let the reader, the audience, the listener decide what side of the fence they want to take. And today I think we have broken the UFO subject down to such finite detail that it's impossible to try and get a true story out anymore. But now let me give kind of a nuance on top of that. Cause you're right. That is, and it's what I used to be a television news reporter in my previous incarnation in local news. And then at CNN, and I would describe the structure of a television news story uh, tended to break down to some say yes, some say no, we say maybe. In other words, your story has a premise. You go out and interview somebody who says yes, and then you find somebody who will say no. You give them equal value, and then the reporter does a stand-up where they stand there and say, well, I guess we'll just never know, and or whatever they say. And that is not good for UFO journalism because what it allows you to do is you go out and you're, you're looking into a story, and then you say, well, we better get the other side. Let's go get a skeptic. Let's go find Robert Schaefer or let's get Neil deGrasse Tyson to come on the air or something like that. And some things are just true. And they they don't need to have a skeptic, right? Some things just need to be discussed. Uh, the Nimitz thing doesn't need a Nimitz skeptic. It needs more people commenting on it as, as to what happened and Absolutely. why did it happen. Absolutely. But, so, it, but I mean, you look at the skeptics that they are using, whether it's Mick West or Neil deGrasse Tyson, these are people who have zero interest, but to bring shame to the subject. That's all yeah. they're, that's all they're using. They're not taking a different angle where, where somebody say like you or I could come on there and, you know, I'm just picking two names, yeah. come on there and say, well, you know what, what we're seeing out of these videos is great, but what we really need to know is where's the rest of them. Yeah. Okay. Why, why, why are, to question what has already come out. So part of the answer to narrative is 
do the people listening tonight and yourself and me and, and the uh, larger ufological crowd, do we or don't we see the UFO disclosure situation as something that requires activism? All right. The civil rights movement required activism. It required rallies. It required knocking on doors. Right. And uh, the same could be said for the ending the Vietnam War. It involved marches on Washington and things, right? Not not taking over the Capitol with guns, sure. but but peacefully assembling and telling people uh, to look into something. Now, so far, the UFO movement has never been able to seriously do that. And my question is, knowing what we know now, is it time for activism? Well, and because that may be what the rest of the narrative needs to be. But the problem is when you look at when you look at UFO activism, you have people taking just one side. Okay, mm -hmm. there's especially on UFO Twitter, where you know, as Lou Elizondo is, has mentioned many a times to me and on other shows, that they're treating him like a demigod. You, yeah. you know, and and you can't do that. You have to be able to see the big picture. But I think what frustrates the community to answer your question even more, and you and I have talked about this privately a couple of years ago. We see in you follow, you can be whatever you want. If right. you if you want to be a journalist, even though you've never worked in journalism before, you just title yourself as a UFO journalist. Well, that's true. That's you know? true, and that's a little weird. We've seen fake scientists. <clears throat> Yes. Come, come across that have been debunked. We we've seen fake researchers that have come in, fake government officials. Look at the mess right now with this Anjali lady who claims to be an uh, the ultimate experiencer. You know, was oh, that the one that had the press conference? conference? Okay, first of all, I, I don't know what I, I looked at that. I was about seven seconds into it and said, "This is bullshit." Excuse me, can I even say that? I guess I can say it. I, I just. It was like, come on, you know, if this, if this person was authentic in any way, uh, they would have conducted themselves differently. Bingo. Yeah. So, Bingo. you know, I, sometimes you, you can't just say, well, could be might let's go get one point of view and let's get the other point. No. I mean, you know, just to look at that person, you go, this is not a credible person. Show me your, you know, if we're going to hold Bob Lazar up, and and say show us all your credentials where's her credentials well i mean john here who's my uh, for all intents and purposes he's my ufo news guy right and he says people are terrified of being duped so they attack anything that looks even a smidge suspicious is jumped on it's ego yeah. self-defense uh yeah uh well nobody wants to be duped um, and people have been duped. Uh, I, I don't think this Angeli thing. I don't know enough about it to comment any more than I didn't than to say I didn't buy it. But people have been getting duped going back to, you know, um, the the alien autopsy, going back to, the, you know, the picture of the uh, alien at the museum that so many people fell for, and and it turned out to be just a a kid. Uh, I, I, people are getting duped, and. The frustration is um, they're getting duped by people who know better and are doing it on purpose. Uh, you, you're probably familiar, well familiar with the Snopes site where, you know, there's some kind of weird piece of news out there. You go to Snopes and they they tell you what the real truth is and you can discredit a lot of these stories. UFOs need a Snopes site, uh, I think. We need something where there's a credible team of people trying to lay out the truth about certain things so that Angeli, for example, would be on our UFO Snopes site and you could go there and go, oh, well, there, there, there's the answer to that. And we don't really have anything like that. I don't think, maybe there is, I haven't seen it, but um, I, I, I think we're, we need to, let, <clears throat> let me put it this way. We're in a terrible problem right now in the world and we need to get disclosure of this UFO thing over and done with. and you know, we, we're going to, as they say, we're going to have to level up. Oh, very true. Very true. We're going to have to level up. Can we do that though, with the amount of differing opinion out there in UFO land? Um, yes, because, um, uh, it's, it's sort of like, um, 
if everybody in UFO land, uh, it, you know what? We can't just appeal to UFO land to use that phrase. The, the whole thing has to be taken to not just the streets, but to average people. So for example, um, when I find a book that I really like, I buy three or four copies of it and I give it to friends. And I say, I want you to read this book, right? I, I take, we have to involve other people, right? And and what I've said for years, and it, it's it's very true. I used to be treated like the drunk uncle at the wedding, all right? I'd be the guy talking about UFOs and and people would say, well, there goes Bryce again. He's talking about UFOs. You know, he's a pretty normal guy most of the time, but then occasionally he goes off the deep end. He loves that shit, you know, and now they don't look at me that way. So something has changed, uh, Dave. I think that's what's interesting. Something has changed. I don't get looked at like the drunk uncle anymore. Now I get people who used to sort of tolerate that kind of talk who like, we'll go out to dinner. I'll go out to dinner with my wife with a, uh, friends or a couple I've never met before. And as soon as they find out that I'm the guy that created dark skies, or I'm the guy that did this or whatever, they ask me questions. They are hungry to know about this topic. So we have to, if you're frustrated with the UFO Twitter crowd, stop talking to them and start talking to average people, because that's where the battle for acceptance is going to be waged. But the problem is we see a lot of people out there in the field who've been here for years giving a lot of, yeah, but this person's a good guy. They may lie right. about their credentials, but this is a good lady. This is a, this is somebody we should be uh, promoting, even though their, their topic is BS or they've been caught lying through their pants. We right. see the UFO public and the, and the, the elders of this community doing that. I had put, I'll give you a quick example of that. I had someone who borrowed a piece of my show. Now our YouTube channel is monetized. Right. This person's channel is monetized. They took a snippet from our show without permission and we are right. copyright and they used it on their channel. I gave him a strike on YouTube. Okay. This person went all over UFO Twitter claiming what a jerk I am. Yeah. And and how bad of a of an egotistical jerk I was that I would hurt his channel for doing this. All he had to do was ask permission. Right. And yet I yeah. had members of that elder community literally calling me up and ripping me for being an a-hole to this person. And I'm trying to explain, hold on, he stole my product. He stole my product without permission. Uh, yeah. Where am I supposed to pre prevent my my product or protect my product? And this is what we have: is we have a oh that person calls him a journalist. Oh, but yeah, but he's a nice person. We shouldn't we shouldn't give that person a hard time because he's nice or she's nice. And, yeah. and this is what we're doing. We have well, okay. So what you're we really have, saying we though? Have, we have forty seconds, by the way. Okay, well. I would just say at the end of the day, we're all going to have, we're going to disagree. And what we have to learn is what your parents taught you, how to be disagree, how to disagree with someone without being disagreeable. It's basic common courtesy and manners. And we have to bring that to this wild Western frontier. But again, I don't want to go to my grave, not knowing the truth because we can't get along with each other. OK, oh, it's time to, to be better than we've been and to get the job done. Well, I will tell you this as we go to break. If I'm a government official with secrets about this and I take a, a quick look into ufology, I would say it's a bunch of wing nuts that are yeah. gathered around and shouldn't be trusted. And that's the truth of the matter. You might All not right. be wrong. All right. We'll get to more questions when we come back. Bryce Zabel, the UFO narrative continues. We got Bryce for another half an hour. And then Dave 101 at the bottom of the hour. We'll be back on Spaced Out Radio. I am so pumped up about this show tonight, man. Oh, man. That's very, that's very nice. Thank you. Um, if you guys, well, you know that we're raising good issues that 
bother me to this day because, um, well, let me tell you, a, a, I don't know that this is the perfect example, but it is an example. Um, when I first started out uh, in drama, all right, I was on a show that I had created called K. O'Brien. And the person who I was working with was a guy named Bill Asher, who was my mentor. Bill is the guy that directed the first couple of seasons of I Love Lucy. He married Elizabeth Montgomery. He was the guy that directed the Beach Blanket Bingo movies and all that. You know, he's a great guy and he was my mentor. And I remember getting really upset about a scene in a script and, you know, and, and just you know, going, oh my God, this is such a disaster. What are we going to do here? And Bill was very calm and he just said, well, it's not going to be in the final product. I just don't see it. Right. He was able to calmly assess that situation. And I think that what we have to do about the, the really crazy sides, you know, not everybody in on Twitter that talks about UFOs are bad people because I have 8,000 or seven, 9,000 people and they're, they're pretty nice to me. Most of them. And they're, they're thoughtful. Most of them. So it's, it's not all the one. So what we have to be able to do is not see that, but, but see what matters. Right. <clears throat> and, and keep our eyes on the ball here. And, and that's moving the, the, disclosure truth ahead um right. so by the, by the way, way i'm looking what ann selene has written there yeah I don't, don't, know what these, don't, don't answer that right I won't, now. but what are all these dollar signs here what does that mean those are what we call super chats where people can donate to the show if they choose oh yeah well god bless them yeah we're uh, very thankful very, very Enough thankful. of those, and you can quit your day job. Oh, oh, by the way, the other thing, you talk about eating your young. I always have to laugh every time somebody goes, well, they're just doing that, so they're making a fortune off their books. Nobody makes a fortune off their books, and nobody makes a fortune at a conference. You know, I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the IUFOC is paying $200 to their speakers. How many people are going to have $200 change their life? You know, do we really have to put down a speaker at a conference because somebody may, they may made $200 and they took 10 hours out of their day to make a presentation. That seems like, like they made 20 bucks an hour, which is minimum wage. Right. So I, I just think we got to stop being so mean to everybody. Yeah. I don't see that happening right now. I know, but I, I, you know, whatever. Uh, Trust me, that's what uh, Dave 101 is going to be about. All right. Well, good. Yeah. Set everybody straight, my friend. Uh, we'll do our best. We will do our best, man, as uh, we got about, uh, let's see here, one, two, just under three minutes here. Well, I would just like to say I have consumed an entire bottle of smart water while, while doing your show. Well, you got three minutes if you need. My plug. No, I'm good. I'm, 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 I'm here. <laughs> me too man me too i really appreciate you doing this uh tonight man really do i see somebody goes bryce does not have a youtube channel no super chats i don't even know how to do a super chat but i do have a youtube channel where i put all the <clears throat> the ad videos and the dark skies videos so if somebody's never seen dark skies before i encourage them to go to my youtube channel and watch all the clips because I put them on there because I thought since they've made it so hard to watch dark, you have to buy the DVD set to watch dark skies, which again, I point out, I don't make a dime from, and I enjoy people watching it because it's a great way to watch it, but you can't stream it any right now. So I fear like I'll give people some clips and they can at least watch it for free. Um, <clears throat> so I hope people will do that. I, I don't even know what a YouTube chat is. Well, when you're live, it opens up a chat room. Yeah. And so people can uh, who are subscribed to your channel, they can come in and, and chat live during the show. You know, I kind of wonder about that because <clears throat> right now I'm a guest and it's easier for me. I pop in, you handle all the details, and I pop out, right? Whereas if I were to start doing my own channel, that might be work. I'm, <laughs> you know, well, so yeah, I don't know. You may have to have a little ADD on it. Like, yeah. 
or sure, ADHD sure. or whatever it is. Uh, hi, Justin. Uh, B. Hoff is wondering in the chat room, he goes, what kind of crime mysteries are you solving with that board behind you? Oh, that's, um, that is that um, is the board where I break my movie and TV projects. Those are cards. Each card is a scene. Um, and um, I've always, I, I, I just don't, break my movies and TV projects on computer. Cause you can't see the big picture. I like to be able to go to that board when I'm work. Cause you usually work collaborating with somebody and I like to be able to take that card down and move it and physically. And I like to, I have very neat handwriting. So I like to write my own cards. I use different colored cards. I use different colored pens. I use little labels. I, you know, anything to help me see the big picture because Part of the problem of writing a film is um, you first have to see the big picture, then you have to fig see the structure, and only after you've seen the structure can you get into actually writing it. If you start writing it before you actually understand what it's about, you're yeah. it's almost doomed to failure, or at least will take you three times as long. So, I'm going to get you to hold on right there. Yeah. Thank you, Mandingo, and Fat Bass, Politically Incorrect, Marie, Lori, Snakes, and Cat Chaser. Here we go with our three. you like to connect with us head to spacedoutradio.com for all your latest show info now back to dave scott and sor kicking off the third and final hour of spaced out radio tonight my name is dave scott thank you so much for tuning us in we really do appreciate earning your listening ears hello to everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates around north america and digitally on talk stream live revolution radio and kpnl all of our archives are free by going to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Just do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club Radio Ghanio Meteor. Yeah, I'm not saying that twice, but the Clam sets the password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website, spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. For the final time tonight, we bring in journalist Bryce Zabel. You can find him on Medium at Trails of the Saucers. This man does fantastic work in breaking down the UFO narrative. Bryce, welcome back. Thank you. I, I, I'm I'm really enjoying this tonight. This is, we're having a, this is a rocking good uh, talk, and I, I think it's... Uh, I don't know if about everyone who's watching it, but I'm awake. Um, I'm having a good time. You know what? We're going to have to do a, a show sometime, maybe by the end of the year, bring you back on. We'll bring on Ross Coltart, maybe yeah. a couple of other journalists, just to kind of talk about the story that that is emanating yeah. going in, you know, the year that was going into 2022. I think right. that would be a, a solid show for us to do. I also enjoy the, the, the I think that, look, what we're doing, the sort of the one-on-one, -on -one, that's a great form fantastic but it's also nice when you mix it up and you have people that are having a conversation that's got a little a lot of different points in it so that's that's Very all cool. so. yeah. i want to start off with ann's question because yeah. she, she asked bryce if the government granted you a one hour interview with an extraterrestrial and a tour of a ship but said you need to drop this entire topic afterwards would you uh, first of all, and that's a really intriguing question on a lot of different levels for me. Uh, it's never happened to me, just to be clear. But I think it's almost the opposite of what would happen. Let's say that the government did grant me a one-hour interview with an ET and a tour of the um, of the ship. I can't imagine they'd do that and say, drop it. I think they'd instead say, You've seen this, you've talked to him, and now we want you to help us with your narrative, with our narrative. I think it's a narrative question. They'd be far more likely to say, hey, man, you've got a platform, you've got a forum, you're, you're a public speaker, we need you to help represent what we want out there, which is interesting because, and the reason I'll tell you why I, I was smiling about it, Ann, is that... Um, Years ago, I had kind of a debate with Carl Sagan in a parking lot about UFOs. And um, I asked him, I said, uh, I had interviewed him for the Voyager 2 Saturn encounter. 
And uh, on the way, I walked him to his car afterwards. It was a national show, and I walked him to his car. And I said, you know, Dr. Sagan, it really is interesting to me that you say that the universe is teeming with life, and yet you also say, and the intelligent life, and yet you also say that they couldn't possibly be here, which is odd to me, uh, because you think that we should go out and explore space. What if other people did that? So he, he was not happy to be challenged. We had a nice little conversation about UFOs. Didn't really think about him for years. He died in 1996. And in 1996, I was doing Dark Skies and we turned Carl Sagan into a character in the show, right? And you can see that clip on my YouTube channel. Um, but what we did with Carl Sagan is we did a, a version of that. The majestic 12 people in Dark Skies bring Sagan in, they pull him off the streets, kidnap him basically. And they say to him, now, Dr. Sagan, you're in no danger. No one's going to hurt you. Uh, but here's the thing. If you want answers to your questions, we can provide them. We actually know what's going on and we'll provide it. Uh, but then you work for us. Uh, if you don't want that deal, uh, there's a car waiting outside and we'll be happy to take you home right now. And Sagan in our show goes, I'll take the deal. I want to know what's going on. And so that's why Sagan became such a uh, debunker of UFOs in our worldview. So I, I, I guess that's a long-winded way of answering your question. I think the answer to that is I would expect them to want more from me than to shut up if they showed me all that stuff. I think they would want me to help with their narrative. I, I'm not going to lie. I can be bought. Yeah. I, 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 I could I could totally be bought by that because number one, I didn't start this show because I had an interest in developing all these topics on a, on a on a very superficial level. I started spaced out radio because of my own experiences that I couldn't find answers for. And the only way I knew how was, well, I dusted off the old uh, broadcast journalism degree and decided to put it back on the wall and 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 try and do something legitimately that I could figure on out. And you know, it's a it's such an interesting hypothetical question though, isn't it? You say you oh, can yeah. be not. I think I think if if that actually got presented to me, I would say uh, I would accept the deal with the idea that I'd be on the inside then and could try to talk them into a better form of communication yeah. with the public. And that would I would sort of take that on. And I will also say, and without getting into it, it's too long of a story, and I don't, I'm, I'm actually writing about it right now, so I don't I'm not really at liberty to talk about all the details. But while doing Dark Skies, and many of you know this, my partner Brent Friedman and I were approached by people who said they were from the Office of Naval Intelligence, and I'm I'm writing a more detailed um, analysis of who they were and why they approached us. So. It's not the craziest thing that you've just said. I'm sure people have been approached because I was. I'm in black. Uh, well, they didn't wear black suits. Uh, uh, and, and again, I'm going to give you like only the 20 second version because I'm doing some investigative work in it that I'll be writing about. But uh, I had a party here at my house, this house, uh, on the night of the Dark Skies premiere. And a guy crashed the party and he said he was with the Office of Naval Intelligence. And we had conversations. And then uh, about a week later, he brought his boss with him to the Dark Skies office. And they both laid out that they wanted to help us make Dark Skies more accurate. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Boy, that, that's a tease right there. Yeah, so I'd be. I'm. I'm actually working on a, on a. As I said, uh, writing about it, and I'll. I'll. I'll try to put more. So look for that. I don't want to get into it right now because I just. Yeah. I'm still in the middle of trying to, uh, you know, do the research and and present it properly. But I'm not trying to hide it. But it did happen. I've talked about it before. Um, whether the people were from the Office of Naval Intelligence or not. Uh, is a, is an open question. Although I would have to say, if they weren't from the Office of Naval Intelligence and they certainly talked like they were, then who would do that? I mean, why why would somebody even think to do that? So I don't know. It's I, I forgot to uh, tell you my story about Justin Trudeau. Oh yes. Oh yeah. Yeah. I want to hear that. Okay. So I was tipped off 
by two different sources, one in Canada's capital of Ottawa, uh, who confirmed it for me, and one out of Washington, D.C., that our ambassador at the time, a gentleman named David McNaughton, met, yeah, met with... Let uh, met with Lou Elizondo's successor to talk about UFOs sometime between August and December of 2019. And McNaughton was then called back to Ottawa to break down the information with Prime Minister Trudeau and with the Defence Minister up here, Harjeet Sajid. Do you think I can get anybody to talk about that story? I have two different sources in two different capitals. Wow. That's cannot, good work. cannot get any paperwork on record. In fact, my Ottawa source behind the scenes has been trying to drop FOIA requests to get the con what was discussed in that meeting. It will not come out. That's uh but okay. That gives me hope. There are people like you pushing for that kind of information Absolutely. and and it's not going to end. And by the way, I see that Irish Lincoln has said, put up Bryce's Twitter. I wouldn't mind it if you could somehow put that up, but I'll, I'll say it verbally. It's at Hollywood UFOs. So at Hollywood and then UFOS at Hollywood UFOs. And I would love, love to have all of you who are listening here there. Thank you. That's terrific. Um, and by the way, if you want to see the articles on Medium, uh, another way to do that would be uh, whatifufos.com. Yes. So those, at Hollywood UFOs for Twitter, whatifufos.com for the Medium articles. I will put that up for our audience. You're a good man. Thank you. I'm not trying, but you know, I'd love to, I love the dialogue. Um and it's it's always good to get feedback, so that's that's great. Absolutely, but when you look at the stories and the oh, that's, I'm sorry, it's not what if dot com. It's what if ufos dot com. What if ufos dot com? Okay, yeah. yeah. All Thank right, you. not a problem. I will put that take that one down. Uh, but when you look at it and you look at this story, that this is a story that is going to affect every single person on this planet. Doesn't matter whether you're an atheist, agnostic, Christian, Catholic, Absolutely. Protestant, Hindu, Muslim, Buddhist, whatever it may be, it's going to affect every person on this problem. Do you think it comes down to the idea that those in charge of this narrative do not want this story coming out because they are afraid of how the people on this planet are going to react. Well, I mean, that was the whole, that goes back to War of the Worlds, 1938, and, you know, the concern. And, and certainly that's why Richard Dolan and I wrote uh, after Disclosure uh, to sort of address that. But I actually have a slightly more nuanced thought on that right now. It's kind of clear to me from even though this hasn't been the perfect rollout it's kind of clear to me that even though there may be forces who are not quite uh in sync with each other about how we should handle this a rollout of sorts is in progress so i don't think the goal anymore at those high levels is to completely deny it. I think there's a different plan that's being unveiled right now. And frankly, I would like to be a consultant to those people and tell them uh, how I think they could do it better. Um, but I, I think a decision has been made that even if it's going to be a rough ride, uh, it's time to do it. So I, I do think the wind is at the back of disclosure. It's just a slower wind. It's not a hurricane yet. It, it's just a slower wind, but we're still going to get there. And so I'm, um, yeah, I, I, I think, you know, it's very funny. Here's what I always say about, um, about UFO disclosure. Uh, many of us have seen Dr. Strangelove and you remember the George C. Scott character, General Buck Turgidson. And when he's talking to the the inner sanctum about nuclear war and how it's survivable, what does he say? He goes, 
I'm not saying we're not going to get our hair must. Okay. That's what I think disclosure looks like. We're going to get our hair must, right? It's not going to be perfect. People are going to hoard toilet paper again, right? Uh, truck drivers who drive gasoline supplies aren't going to show up for work every day. Uh, there'll be lines at gas stations. Um, there'll be there'll be a lot of disruption, and but we'll probably do better. I mean, look, our what could we do that would in disclosure of UFO reality that would be much more disruptive than what we've just been through with COVID and uh, you know the the whole political disruption of the United States. So I, you know, um, we're going to be able to handle it. We can handle the truth. We can, I, I'm, I'm not sitting comfortable with that. And, and I'll tell you why. I mean, you brought up some great examples. I think COVID has been, you know, doesn't, I'm not a, I'm going to get into the whole vax thing, anti-vax thing. It's not about that. But I think what we've seen with COVID, the way people have treated each other through COVID, hogging milk, ripping yeah. milk out of a uh, out of a mother's arms while her child yep. uh, needs milk, toilet paper, meat. I mean, you saw the the videos of people literally carrying three thousand dollars worth of meat in two yep. buggies. You know, it, it's ridiculous. It's going to be. I don't get. I just need to make it clear. Um, I believe it's going to be a rough ride. Okay. I'm not saying it's going to be simple. In fact, um, I put my money where my mouth is. Dolan and I wrote an entire book about it. And I urge people that book has aged well. As I said, this is the 10th anniversary of AD after disclosure. Um, I urge people to still read that because you know why Richard Dolan and I wrote that book? Because we wanted to read it and nobody had written it. So we wrote the book that we wanted to read right? We researched it. We wrote it. We debated it, et cetera. We put it out. And I, if you'd asked me 10 years ago when we put it out, um, if it would still be the only book of its kind today, I would have said, no, no, there'll be, you know, half a dozen more by 10 years from now, but there hasn't been one. So I, I still think it, while it's not correct in virtually every assumption, as we said earlier at the beginning of it, a lot of it is dead on. Like when we said disclosure happens on a Friday after four o'clock, we made about 500 predictions like that in that book. And a lot of them are uh, turning out to be true. And without getting into too many details, um, I hope to have an announcement soon about how AD is going to have life as something that is not a book, but is is in the um, television world. Fidgety Aura makes a good comment here. We can, most people yep. will probably cope, but the percentage of people losing their minds will be high enough to cause chaos. I agree. I agree. It is going to be a bumpy ride. And in fact, one of the things that AD tried to do is, here's just so everyone understands, we said AD was such a big deal. Disclosure is such a big deal that it's the equivalent of Jesus Christ, right? So they'd start the calendar over. So BC is before confirmation. AD is after disclosure, right? And we are in the twilight shadow world right now between BC and AD. And what we, what Dolan and I tried to do with AD is, okay, there's AD plus one day, right? What's that first day look like? What's that first week look like? What's that first month look like? And so what I'm agreeing with everybody is, yes, people are going to be losing their minds, depending on how clear the disclosure is. And the first month is going to be extraordinarily bumpy, and maybe the first year, and maybe even the first decade. But if we survive as a species through all these difficulties we're in right now, eventually it will be incorporated into the human experience and we'll cope somehow, some way, because that's what people do. All right. We got five minutes left with you tonight, Bryce. Yeah. And I'm going to ask you this. Give me the top five people that Bryce Zabel trusts for information regarding Ooh. UFOs. That's interesting because I don't trust any one person with everything. So I've, I've mentioned that my collaborator on AD is Richard Dolan. Um, 
I don't agree with everything that Richard says. For example, we disagree about 9-11, which is not a UFO issue, but he believes one thing and I don't believe it. And by the way, I do want to acknowledge one thing. I was the chairman of the Television Academy when 9-11 hit. So I'm the guy that postponed the Emmys twice that year. 49 years of Emmys and they'd never been postponed, did it twice. I learned a lot about crisis uh, management and I, that is part of what gives me some hope that we can get through disclosure. But now to answer your question. So let me give you five people who I trust a lot of what they say and like a lot of what they say. It's Dolan. I like Whitley Strieber. I think when he sits down and writes an essay that isn't about some of the other stuff, but is about his analysis of the politics of the situation. I like what he, what I like how he talks. Um, I like on a daily basis, as I said, I like to read uh, good old Ryan Robbins. I just like the way that guy rolls. I like the way he talks. Um, but people whose sources of information I trust, very high, I put George Knapp, very high. And that's four. Um, and the, you know what? It's an imperfect thing because I can't remember the very people that I would probably stick up there. Um, I think, um, well, I, I, these days, Ross Coulthard is is on my list. I, I'm i really bonding with this guy's, I, I got the mind meld going on with this guy. I think, I think he's going to be an important player. And um, he's, he's probably somebody I agree with more across the board. Do you, so, yeah. do you trust the intelligent community? Not really. I mean, some. Well, you know, I mean, look, I'll tell you someone who I like a lot who's got intelligence connections is, is Mellon, Chris Mellon. I mean, do I do I know everything about the guy? Do I know everything about Lou Elizondo? I don't. But do I think that overall they're probably trying to lay something out that makes sense and that is legit? I think they probably are. What about Danny Sheehan? I met Danny. I had lunch with him back when I was chairman of the Academy. I like him. Um, I don't know enough about what he's saying right now today to, to, to take a position. Okay. What about, what about Lou? I like Lou. Um, I, you know, I don't, I'm not one of the people that automatically say, well, you know, he comes from the intelligence world. Therefore you can't trust anything he says. Uh, it, I think sometimes things can be what they look like. And what it looks like to me is whoever is in charge, let Lou go do these things. So he's doing what comes natural to him. And people who are in positions of authority are not stopping him. I will say this about Lou Elizondo as an experiencer. I think he's an a, he's a major experiencer. I think he has seen things that we could only imagine yep. from from movies like Close Encounters of yep. the Third Kind and whatever. And I think that he if he was ever able to be released from his NDAs to tell his true story, yep, the, with this whole topic would be way further ahead than where we are. I listen. That's what I think. I I, I believe. Well, I mean, listen. I just like to think that after 30 years of doing journalism and drama, you know, both together, I become a fairly good judge of sort of character. When I watch somebody, I judge his character to be decent and honest. Me too. Maybe I'm wrong, but that's how he hits me. Bryce Abel, 30 seconds. Tell everybody where they can find you. Okay, listen, I'd love to be in touch with all of you on Twitter, and that is at Hollywood UFOs, all right? But some of the more interesting things that I'm doing is on the Medium platform, all right, uh, I have a, a publication called Trail of the Saucers. We have over 150 articles now that are really high quality articles. Uh, you can sort of get a gateway into those articles at whatifufos.com and also just on Medium. Just go to Medium and look up my name and you'll you'll find my articles. Bryce Sable, everybody, great friend of this show, so we respect him highly. Coming up next. Right Dave, on, everybody. Thank you. Coming up next, Dave 101. Oh, the anger, the <laughs> deceit. The UFOs next.
that went way too fast, man. Oh, that was fun. Way too fast. Well, thank you for being such a great host and <laughs> interviewer and positive energy. And it was just all terrific. Got requests from my audience on your YouTube channel to do some live chats. Okay. Well, I'll, you know what? I may be in touch with you to figure out how to do that. Yeah, man. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'd be happy to do it. Um, but you don't live chat by yourself, do you? Don't you have to uh, have somebody to talk to? Or Oh, your, the minute you put it out, your your audience will show up. Oh, anyway. well, maybe I should try that. Yeah. Yeah. All you right. Well, listen, um, it, this was great. Um, I hope, I hope people liked it and, um, and it was my pleasure to be a part of it. So thank oh, you. Really appreciate you. We'll talk soon. Okay. All right. Yes, you will. Good luck with the rest of your show. I don't know how I bail out of this. I'll bail you. Out. All I'll right. Bail. You bail me out. All right. Bye-bye. Thanks take again. Bye-bye. Bryce Zabel, everybody. Bryce Zabel. That was a good show. Not going to lie. That was a great show. Got a lot of stuff on there. A lot of stuff on there. <clears throat> Thank you, everyone. That was a lot of fun. That was a lot of fun. Good night, Laurie. Feel good after that one. I feel real good after that one. Dave 101 next. I'm excited about it. What kind of cookies Irish Lake could? Thank you, Spooky. Really appreciate that. Thank you so much for that awesome super chat. Is the rumor true that it's Katie's birthday? Because I sung happy birthday to her and she got mad at me last night. Thank you, Brian. We're doing our best. We got a good team in, uh, in Spookles the Cat and Dirty Filth and everyone chipping in to great, get these great guests. So give all the credit to them. Uh, science Bob is doing better. He is going to be on his way home here soon. And well, he's not doing better. His emergency family, uh, family emergency is getting better, which is good. So that's a positive sign. Where's Eric Cooper? Is Eric Cooper still here? I saw you, Coop. No hiding that beautiful face and beard from me, man. Wizard Grin, how you doing? Oh, there's Coop. My man, Eric Cooper. Been with me forever, man. Love this man. One of the smartest guys in ufology ever.
Hey, look who it is. It's Ozzy Rob. How's tomorrow looking? How's them ham hocks? All right, big thank you to Spooky, to Chuck, to Mandingo, and Fat Bass, or Bass, Politically Incorrect, Marie, Lori, Snakes, and Cat for an awesome night of Super Chats. Really appreciate it. We're going to get going here with Dave 101 next, so sit back. Here we go. We've rounded third. We're heading for home tonight on Spaced Out Radio. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate earning your listening ears wherever you are on this beautiful planet we call Earth. Want to say hello to, uh, and remind everybody that you can check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do old Davey the favor. Hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio, and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. It's time, once again, for a little Dave 101. Now, when I started Dave 101 just a few weeks ago, I told everybody how I hate ufology, how I hate it these days, you know, the monotony, the news, the, the different tribes that are all kind of coming together and blasting and beating the hell out of everyone verbally on Twitter and other social media platforms. And I will tell you this, I'm glad I stepped away. I'm glad I stepped away. Why? Because I feel like I can breathe again. I feel like I can have that outsider's perspective of what is going on without the daily diatribe and mishmash of the BS that is currently out there and the debates that continue to go on and on and on ad nauseum. Let me tell you this. It is something of a relief for me to be able to say, I don't care about ufology anymore. I really don't. Why? Well, as we talk tonight about the egos, the narrative with Bryce Abel, you will see that even some of the best investigators in this field like Bryce are having the same attitude about it. This was proof in the pudding that other people are actually getting sick of it as well. Because if I don't agree with your opinion or you don't agree with my opinion, immediately you are a jerk and someone that needs to be put down all the way to the point of trying to get you banned from your show, banned from your networks, banned from everywhere. We want to shoot each other until we are all done and dead in the field of ufology. There is no break unless you decide yourself to step away. So somebody asked me the other day, they said, Dave, why do you want to step away from UFOs when your show is about UFOs? Well, it's about a lot of topics. We just like the weird and strange. But it's the anger in the people that have really turned me off. People accusing others of being liars about their experiences, not just me. Liars about their programming, liars about their listenership, liars about everything. It's tough to take. The majority of people in this field who are broadcasting to you this news, whether it's UFO videos, whether it's podcasts, whether it's research from MUFON or whomever, there's always got to be someone who tries to bring you down. A great example of this is MUFON. I know people on MUFON's board of directors. I know people who are MUFON investigators. And apparently one dirty duck makes a whole team. 
That's the way we're supposed to think in today's, oh my goodness, type of world. I can't believe that. Look at that. Cancel culture. Okay, when Jan Harzan did his thing and decided that he was going to try and pick up young girls as the head of MUFON, using MUFON's computers, immediately everybody targeted MUFON as almost like a pedophile type outfit. Not true. Not true at all. I remember talking to one member who was almost in tears because they couldn't believe that this was happening. That's one. That's an example. All right. We want to always seem to kill one each of, of each other here in this field. For what? What is the purpose? What is the purpose of raking a, an experiencer over the coals because you do not like what they said? Then people will say, well, aren't you doing that to Angeli? No, I think Angeli needs a lot of questions asked. And canceling interviews at the last minute is not one way to do that. It's just a tiring field of rhetoric that is going nowhere because the minute you bring up something logical, the illogical jump all over you. It wears you thin. It tires you out. It brings off stress. And then you look at yourself and you wonder, is this even worth it? What am I doing here? If people can't see the UFO narrative for what it is, one of the successful parts of this entire narrative has been to tear this community apart. A once proud, beautiful community filled with woo, filled with incredible stories that has turned into going for the jugular on everybody. We see it with Travis Walton and Mike Rogers, where now after 40 years, Walton is a liar. So some say. I still believe his story. I still believe the fact that he passed a number of lie detector tests. I see good people dropping out of the field, like my friend Eric Cooper from Forest Moon Paranormal, because after 20 years, he's had enough of the BS, enough of the lies, enough of the, of the stealing and a lack of camaraderie. Where we should be pumping people up, we are trying to tear their walls down, and it's not fun. And it's a decision to back away from ufology and the, the deep part of it that I am really enjoying these days. I'm very much enjoying it. It's tiring because we're not allowed to believe anybody. And if you back somebody and their experiences or you back somebody in their research, you become a target now in this industry. And I'm done with being a target. I'm done with, with the drama that happens. Look, there's always going to be people who talk poorly of you or ill of you. That happens. But we're done with being targets for talking about topics that we love. Talking about stories that we love. We need to get back to understanding that whether you like it or not, those who have had some major really cool experiences, whether it's Betty and Barney Hill, whether it's Travis Walton, whether it's Calvin Parker, whether it's Samantha Mowat, Chris Bledsoe, and his entire family. They have a place here. They are allowed to have a place. What we see on social media, not all the time, but some of the time, is rather disgusting. The personal attacks, the accusations, and usually the people who are saying this have absolutely no proof. All right? It's like the age-old argument where if I came out and say, the sky is blue, but somebody's like, aha, caught you. You missed the cloud in the east. The sky's not blue. It's cloudy as well. Caught you. You missed it. You're lying. The sky is not blue. It is both 
sun and clouds today. Bottom line, we're always looking to try and push people off that ledge. We rip people from making money off their books. We rip people for taking in conferences. We rip people for getting opportunities, even though their credentials don't hold the weight that they are being given the opportunity for. As we said with Bryce, we have a community of, of people who just make up a title and decide that that's what they are. Fake scientists, fake journalists, fake researchers, fake demonologists in the paranormal. We've seen it all. There are some brilliant, brilliant minds in this community, from professional journalists to professional scientists to professional researchers. And unfortunately, for some reason in UFOs, that isn't good enough anymore. It's not good enough. And it makes me question whether or not we truly, truly want disclosure, whether we truly want to know the answers to the questions that we have even deserve it, considering how we treat the entire community. Look, I'm not trying to put myself on a pedestal. I've fallen for the drama as well. And Lord knows that I've hashed out some of the drama by calling out people for lying about their credentials over time. I do that to try and protect my listeners from fake information. I don't want our spaced out radio listeners quoting people who lie that they're a scientist or quoting people who lie that they're a journalist or quoting people who are absolutely ripping the shreds out of experiencers, or officials. It's not what we're about. We're better than that. This is a better community than what we are giving ourselves credit to. And more importantly, it's a better community than the way we are acting. S social media has become a war zone for ufology. It really has. People defending people who have criminal records, people exploiting people for information and using it as their own, people lying about their own stories in order to get that contact or get on that interview with that radio show or podcast or YouTube channel. We see it every day. How do we make it better? We make it better by you, the listener tuning in and looking for the quality. It's not about the quantity out there. It's about the quality. What resonates with you? You, the listener, are the ones who can control all of this and turn it around. How? If you know somebody has a, that is, is doing what isn't good for ufology, stop supporting them. Stop supporting the negativity. Stop supporting the, the bitchiness of this community. Can I say that on the radio? Sure. We're going to get away with that one tonight. Because there is a lot of good information out there that people are working diligently on to bring to you if you listen and if you know where to look. Keep your eyes open but keep your ears open wider because we want to get that information out to you. But this should be enjoyable as well. For the majority of people out here, they want that information out. They don't care how they get it. And some of them, it's very successful. I look at somebody like Nicole Sackage, who is a brilliant, brilliant researcher for Grant Cameron and on her own always vetting her sources, always vetting her information. That's what we need to go for. Those who are credible in this field. But unfortunately, what we are seeing today, especially on social media, from YouTube to UFO Twitter, we are seeing the worst of the worst. Because if I disagree with you and you disagree with me, now you have to cut me down and insult me. And the fact that the majority of people, especially on UFO Twitter, 
who hide behind four or five or eight different profiles, the attacks just keep coming. Not just on me, on others as well. It's daily. It's rampant. It's disgusting. To clean up this field, it starts with the listeners, those who are like the people in our chat room tonight or listening to this show, who are just going to have enough of the BS. Well, then you say, well, how do I find out what's BS and what's not? Real easy. Real easy. Go with your gut. Go with that feeling inside. You know what's best for you. You know what's right for you. If it's insultive, if it's antagonizing, it probably isn't the right information. And do your homework on people. Check their resumes. It's easy to tell that Bob McGuire, Dr. Science Bob, worked at Virginia Tech University. It's easy to know that Richard Dolan was a university professor in history. It's easy to tell by listening to Bryce Zabel or Ross Coltart that they are professional journalists. That's where it comes down to. When you feed the anger, when you feed the hate, it only makes the fire bigger. Or you can help be a part of extinguishing it. That is your Dave 101 for the day. Thank you so much for listening to me. Get right to it. Get down and dirty. And we'll do it all again next week. Now it's time for the Newswire. Shirky Poo, what do you got for us? The news is always changing, which is why we bring you the SOR Newswire. At the back end of every show, we get sometimes to the really awesome Like this one, if you're a Spider-Man fan, how would you like to own issue number one? Yes, the comic that debuted, Queen's Friendly Neighborhood Spider-Man, has been auctioned off for a record-setting $3.6 million. The 1962 Marvel issue, Amazing Fantasy number 15, was sold at Heritage Auctions, Signature Comic, and Comic Art. Before all the... Clones, symbiotes, and civil wars, we see Spider-Man in a much simpler time doing what he does best, catching crooks and saving the day. And, of course, written by the famous Stan Lee, penciled by Steve Ditko, and saw Jack Kirby collaborate on the cover. The print of Amazing Fantasy, which features a cover of Peter Parker, the timid teenager, shocking the world as the web slinger, is known to be one of the four near-mint copies of the comic with a certified guaranteed company rating of 9.6. Yeah, $3.6 million. How awesome is that? If I only had that, I can definitely say I would not spend it on a comic. Scary stuff. A situation potentially here on the International Space Station. Astronauts aboard woke up to fire and smoke alarms triggered by an incident in the Russian Zvezda module early on Thursday. The crew saw smoke and smelled an odor of burnt plastic, which was recharging its batteries at the time. Though the exact cause of the smoke and odors is not yet clear, the ISS crew restored safe air quality in the station by activating an aggregate filtration system, according to the Russian space agency Roscosmos. The incident is not expected to interfere with ISS activities, including a seven-hour spacewalk scheduled for Thursday, which will be conducted by cosmonauts Oleg Novitsky and Pyotr Dubrov. Moving on. All right. Let's see here. What do we got? A company is seeking a horror fan to get paid 1300 bucks to watch 13 creepy classics and monitor their heart rate to compare their fear factors of high and low budget films. 
Finance Buzz, a financial advice website, announced it is seeking a horror movie heart rate analyst to watch 13 horror films with varying budgets and compare the scares from big budget movies to their low end counterparts. The chosen candidate will use a Fitbit device to track heart rates while watching the movies. The films selected by the website are Amneville Horror, A Quiet Place, A Quiet Place Part 2, Candyman, Insidious, The Blair Witch Project, Sinister, Get Out, the Purge, Paranormal Activity, and the 2018 remake of Halloween. The lucky candidate hired for this ghostly gig will be paid $1,300 for their efforts. We'll also provide a Fitbit to wear during the movie marathon and a $50 gift card to cover the cost of movie rentals. Applications are being accepted through September 26th. And finally tonight, Interesting one here. A Florida sheriff's deputy, who is also a beekeeper, came to the rescue when a fallen tree fell on a Florida home, causing hundreds of bees to swarm. The Volusia County Sheriff's Office said that a large tree fell on a home in Deland, causing the hundreds of Italy honeybees, Italian honeybees, that is, living in the tree to swarm the house. This stepped into Deputy David Wiggins' household, whose family has been involved in beekeeping since World War II, it summoned the, he was summoned to the scene to collect the swarming insects. He was stung about 10 times in the situation, but the bees, nonetheless, are all safe and sound. Quick thought of the day, Ave, happens every night at this time where we ask a question on our social media pages. What is your opinion of the UFO narrative? Start off with Ted. I always wondered what it meant by narrative. Davey, I think that the current mainstream narrative is divisive. Kevin, the misuse and abuse of the concept, phrase, doctrine, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of a few. Huge comment there, Kevin. Vince, the previous narrative was of one that they simply did not exist in ridiculing anyone who reported a UFO with the stigma of being less than credible witness to learning more about UFOs. Chris, another Chris, uh, usually it is written after the preface of a good novel or play. Joe gets the final word. I would listen to the UFO narrative more if it was narrated by Morgan Freeman. Thank you to everybody hanging on out with us. What a great show tonight. We got Mr. Ron Bumblefoot Thal rocking in the background with Little Brother is watching. Bumblefoot is the official music of Spaced Out Radio, rocking us in and out of every single show. Get your horns up for the guitar god himself. Special thanks to everybody listening in at home, at work, in your cars, wherever you may be. Thank you to everyone in our chat rooms tonight on YouTube, LGAB, Revolution Radio, Spreaker, the Facebook Space Travelers Club, and on Twitter at hashtag Spaced Out Radio. I know you're Remember, this show is copyright by Spaced Out Radio and SOR Media Ventures Limited. Thank you so much for choosing to share your evening with us because together, my friends, we own the night. Mr. Bumblefoot, we need a favor. We need you to take us home. Yes, the Wu train has docked for the night. But soon, my friends, we shall ride again. Your seats are always available. Your tickets never expire. And if you want to bring a friend, yep, we've got room for them too. Good night. All right, there we go. Oh, whoo! Good show. Good show. That was good. What do you all think?
How many will you be responsible for, Dave? I don't understand that. Thanks, uh, Roy. Appreciate that, man. Copyrighted what? What am I missing here? How many will each of you be responsible for? I don't understand, Xavier. What am I missing here? Honestly, I don't understand. Help me out. Ask Joe Monk. Ask Joe Monk. Lanky. Okay. What am I asking Joe Monk about? We own the night. Uh, happy face with sunglasses. LOL, Alien, Batman. Okay, you got to help me out with that, man. I can't just keep scrolling through the chat room. Just fill me in. Awesome show. Thanks, Chuck. Appreciate your super chat there. Bryce was a good interview. Bryce was a very good interview. Oh. Oh, I see. Uh, Ozzy Rob, that's good ham hock there tonight, man. Very good, Ham Hawk. Thank you for that. Yeah. All right. We're not going down that path, Xavier. Uh, nobody here is one of them, so we're just not going to acknowledge it and go down that path at all, okay? Uh, B. Huff, my cheeks are getting fat. How do I combat this? You contact Ozzy Ange, who owns a fitness center with her beautiful family, and uh, you ask her for help on the dietary substance. Uh, I'm drinking iced tea tonight. Close that up, close that up, close that up, close that up. All right. Hey, Spudgy, how you doing? Wayland, good to see you. Yeah, we're not doing politics, Xavier. We don't do politics in our uh, chat room, okay? Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter what the topic is or who we all support. We don't do politics. So uh, we're not going there. Everybody in the chat room knows that. Oh, uh, my vape is uh, pineapple. It's really good. It's uh, pineapple ice. Or if you want the French, ananas glacé. I think this one's almost done. Pineapple just... You know, what's funny is I don't like pineapple whatsoever. I think it's grotesque as a fruit. I really do.
the little pods, just like that. All right, I guess we can start editing. Any questions, comments about uh, my Dave 101 today? Help me out. Good, bad, indifferent? Let me know. Did I screw it up? Did I say enough? Not say enough? It's your time to hammer me on it. I found myself getting really, really frustrated with the UFO community because lack of a better term, I felt that people who were really, really brilliant just were not listening. And I got sick of the yeah buts that were out there. Like the story I told about the uh, with Bryce about the guy who uh, used one of our videos and uh, was financially profiting on it on his YouTube channel. Right? And I ended up being the bad guy for calling him out on my product that he stole. That's where I get a little bit frustrated with things. Right? And, you know, this community lately, I've seen so many people on UFO Twitter uh, just getting carved for just putting information out there. You don't have to agree with the information. You don't have to you don't have to like the information. Um Brian, good question. I, I was waiting for you to say something. Um like I, I'm I'm gonna restate this just so you remember. Um I don't, well, let me say it this way. I believe Anjali had some experiences. I do. Totally believe that. What I don't like is the way she has handled her coming out party. That's the big one, is the coming out party. Okay, and the poor lady is being hit from so many different angles right now because of the way she chose to come out that I don't know if we'll ever find out the real truth. I really don't. And it's sad because I think she may have an important story to tell but the way her handlers, like from that press conference, I went and had another look at that press conference the other day. I did. I was bored at my daytime job, and I turned it on. And I'll tell you, it was, I felt bad for her through that entire phenomena or through that entire film. I did. I thought she was handled completely wrong.
And unfortunately, she'll end up paying the price for that because of the way that whoever is guiding her through this process has made a mockery potentially out of her story. That's what I believe. I watched about, uh, to be blunt with you, I did not watch the whole thing. I watched about the first 32 minutes, 35 minutes of it. I did not like the way she uh, was announcing how she's changed names uh, so many times. I find that suspicious. There's just a lot of things when I see her story, there's a lot of things that I see that there are, there are a lot of holes. Uh, Brian here. The difference I see is that Angelini seems to be promising confirmation by announcing a return to the tunnel. If that doesn't happen, then I guess we can all forget it like so many other stories. Absolutely, Brian. Absolutely. And we're going to have to take a wait and see approach with her. I'm always, for some reason, okay, and I'm going to use Anjali as a, as an example of this because it's, because it's the um, flavor of the day, so to speak. Okay. But I have a real, real tough time with anyone who enters the community and says, oh, the aliens gave me this name. This is what they called me. And I've changed my name to this. And I want to be uh, uh, announced as this person now or identified as this person. I have a real, real weird, like to me, I don't know why, but it's a red flag. Okay. It's just a, a red flag that I don't quite understand. Okay. Don't ask me why. It's just one of those weird, weird little quirks that I have regarding this field. And I know other people who have done that too. They've, they've left their human name behind and gone with some alien name. All right. And to me, it just seems really fake. Like you're trying really hard to put yourself on a pedestal above any other experiencer who has had some sort of contact. Uh, but Brian, uh, okay. Brian says, I think she was trying to protect herself through anonymity. That's understandable. Lots of experiencers do that. I understand that. But when she rattles off her real names in the press conference and that the aliens gave me Anjali, uh, tough to swallow. Tough to swallow. I know a psychic um, who I had a lot of personal experiences with while I was opening up, who did the exact same thing and changed her name to something else. And everybody called it for what it was. It was ego. Brutus, thank you so much for that super chat. Really do appreciate that. Thank you. Well, I mean, but I mean, Brian, I mean, she's the one at, at cause for that. I mean, that's the big thing. You don't announce where it is or give people a clue. They're going to try and go find it.
Like you can't, everybody is trying to corroborate her story. That's the big thing. Everybody wants to, uh, wants to corroborate her evidence. Look, I'm not saying my evidence that I have or my stories that I have are better than hers or anything like that. I do believe that she is an experiencer. I really do believe that, right? Just like I believe Joe Monk in the chat room denies his alien contact. And I'm right about that. Totally right about that. All right, uh, tomorrow night on the show, the crypto guru, Ryan uh, Ronald Murphy, is back. And then Saturday, Gary Spikes Jr. will be filling in for a vacationing Lynn Wallington. They'll be talking demonology. And then Lynn will be back on Sunday night for her regular shift. And Lynn will have, uh, who does she have on? She has Samantha Mowat on Sunday. So we got a great next three days lined up for you guys. Tammy, that's more believable than Anjali. I'm gonna, just going to be honest with you. That is way more believable than Anjali. Gary's going to do a great job on Saturday, guys. Brian, I, I thank you. I, I do. I totally thank you for being here, man. Does what mean no, Don? Look, my goal for the audience, for our audience, which is you guys listening, is not to uh, fidgety aura. We're going to start relaunching the weekend shows on Spreaker as well as YouTube as well. Um, I don't know. I don't know, Behoff. Yeah. Read up. God, I... Does that mean no? Now I got to find Don here. I mean, on your show, have you had the lady that was with you during your visit? Uh, Samantha Mowat. Yes. Yes. She'll be on Sunday with Lynn. Samantha will be on with Lynn once a month now. It's going to be a recurring guest on the show. But yes, uh, we are going to go back on Spreaker for the weekend shows. We were able to figure that out uh, earlier this week uh, to try and make sure that the systems for both Lynn and Gary uh, were working. Oh, no problem, sweet Donnie D. That's okay. It's all cool, man. Anyways, what I was saying is, my goal for the audience is to edu is to help educate all of you guys and ladies out there or however you identify as much as I can to, to try and bring integrity back to this field. Um, I We really try hard not to bring on imposters or posers or credential liars uh, on here because we don't like, if I'm not going to associate with this person, if I wouldn't have a beer with this person, I likely won't bring them on the show and I don't even drink beer. Right. 
right? Rosh Lambda, how are you? And, you know, I I don't care who you listen to, what you listen to, what you want to believe, okay? Because you're always going to have free will in your choice for what you what satisfies your listening or viewing curiosity. I'm not going to sit here and say, listen to that show, but don't listen to that one. That's not fair to our listeners, which is you, and it's not fair to other people who are putting really hard work into their programming. You know, uh, what we what we do need, though, is my job is to, is to try and educate you guys that if you're looking for information, check out the resumes of the people, right? For instance, there is no such thing as a UFO journalist. No such thing whatsoever. There's no such thing as an expert in this field. We may throw around the word expert as conjecture or just something to say, but in reality, there are no experts in this field. If you want to know if somebody is a doctor, a true doctor of science or mathematics or philosophy or whatever, check it out online. Everything can be found on Google, right? But the main thing that I want you guys to do is is just, uh, you know, my entire goal is to make sure that you get the information that you need from proper people. That's that's the big thing, is get that information. You don't have to believe me. You don't have to believe my experiences. You don't have to believe Samantha's experiences, our Keith Andrews, whoever comes on the show. You don't need to believe them. Right? Because that's your choice. But if we bring you you will notice that there's a lot of popular people in this field that you haven't seen on this show. And you will notice that a lot of them will never come on this show because of lying about resumes, lying about who they are. Um, it's not good for any of us. It really isn't. One second here. I'm just downloading the show. There we go. That one's going. That one's going. Good, good. Any other questions? YJ Overlander, you could actually go meet our Keith Andrews. He's in Kelowna. Nice and close to you. TFV, how are you? 
I'd like to see the average Joe who has a genuine story come on, the name changers, people like, well, like the journalist, I won't use her name, just make me mad because it's obvious they become liars. Paula, you, you. Yes, we were talking Bob Lazar earlier in the episode. By Gorilla Tape. I don't, I don't understand that polar eclipse. Uh, John Hudson is probably lurking around here somewhere. Uh, past life, we got to do that a little bit more. We haven't had a show on past life in a while. Uh, do I ever lose it or, or snap calmly on the air? I have. I have. It's very rare. Um, it's very rare. I would say the last time I really lost it on the air was when this dude started yelling at me on my show for asking him questions. Ah, uh, Coop, I'm sticking around. My Magic 8 Ball is a special 8 Ball uh, that is a Buzz Lightyear Magic 8 Ball. That's why it's white. I saw it. Was shopping for uh, Christmas presents for my boy, and I saw it there, and I said, "Screw this! I'm totally getting it for myself." And at the time, another host who was close to me, him and I were going to do a special Magic Eight Ball video show on my channel, and that never came to fruition. Uh, we've actually had a number of bear, not at my place. He's still about, but, uh, an, another, it might be the same bear, maybe another one, but apparently a bear today, just a couple streets up from me, chased someone into their house. So I know the area, uh, probably because of the fires and everything pushed, there seems to be a lot of bear activity around here this year, higher than normal. Hey, Cooper, I'll call you when I'm done. I know you'll still be awake. Bears are just doing their bear thing. They're getting fat before, uh, before they got to go hibernate. Got about another month, uh, month and a bit of this before they head into the mountains and Find their place. I would sooner deal with a black bear than a than a grizzly bear. And thank goodness we don't have grizzly bears where I am in my area. I mean, if I go into the mountains, uh, they're right there. But oh, excuse me, owner. Thank you. How's turkey today, buddy? See, I told you John Hudson is uh, lurking. Told you. Mystics Walk, how are you? Oh, they had to, you had to put your puppy down. Very sorry. Let's send some love and prayers to Mystics Walk here uh, for her and her husband. Uh, they had to put their puppy down due to prostate cancer. Absolutely, Mystics Walk. We will definitely do that. We can totally do that. Very sorry to hear that. Very sorry. Owner, I thought you were in Turkey. 
Not North Carolina. Now I'm screwed up. Who's our listener in Turkey then? Or are you from Turkey? I messed right up. Yeah, that is the absolute worst mystics walk and putting a pet down. I don't find that fun at all. I don't find I've had to do that. And uh, I had one of my dogs pass away in my, in my arms. And that sucks. Actually, twice I've done that. Um. Oh, owners from Turkey living in North Carolina. Okay. Cool. Alien Believers, how are you? Yeah, that sucks. I want to get older. I, I just can't handle it. I don't like it. Just heartbreaking. Heartbreaking. Yeah, my last my last dog, my Chihuahua Dachshund crossed. Um, I tried. Get, she collapsed. I think she had a heart attack, and then a piece of uh, hot dog got caught in her throat. And try and giving her mouth to mouth to revive her, and it just wasn't working. She uh, passed away right in my arms. That one sucked. My little cuddle buddy. Light 1978, welcome to our chat room. How are you? Thank you, Ozzy Steve, for that amazing super chat. Really appreciate it. Well, the way I look at it, she died doing what she did, uh, what she loved doing. And um, she loved eating. She would bully the two big dogs out of their food because she just loved eating. That was uh, her thing. So the fact that she passed away with a hot dog stuck in her throat, I'm calling that a good death for her. Tried digging it out. I got one piece out. And, uh, yeah, that just sucked. That just sucked. I don't know if I can do the dog. After my two dogs leave, I don't know if I can do the dog thing anymore. It's just way too, way too shitty. Way too shitty. I mean, I probably will. Probably will, but like when my two dogs go, I just don't know how I'm going to do it. Um, ah, did I see that or not? Owner, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. You know, when I cross the pearly gates, one of the questions that I'm going to ask God when I get that opportunity is why are dog life so short? Because it really, really sucks. It really sucks. But then again... So does living as humans. It really sucks. Our lives are way too short. All 
All right. Not to end on a downer, but we are going to shut this thing down for the night. Big thank you to Ozzy, Steve, Brutus, Spooky, Chuck, Mandingo, and Fat Bass, Politically Incorrect, Marie, Lori, Snakes on a UFO, and Cat Chaser for the awesome super chats. Really do appreciate uh, all of your love and support of this show. Thank you so much to all of our veterans who are listening to this show. We love you. This is always a good, safe place for all of you to hang on out and uh, absolutely appreciate each and every one of you and the sacrifices you've made. And thank you to all of our regulars out there who hang out and be with us each and every night. You guys make it really, really uh, appreciative. Owner, I did get that. I will check it out here after the show. Thank you so much. Tomorrow night on the show, the crypto guru, Ronald Murphy. Then Saturday, uh, Gary Spikes Jr. is going to fill in for a vacationing Lynn Wallington. And his guest is going to be Mr. Gorga, a demonologist talking demons all night long. Lynn will be back on Saturday with Samantha Mowat and their new monthly special. So check it on out. We're going to have a great time. And uh, thank you to each and every one of you tuning us in. Do us a favor. If you haven't hit that subscribe button yet, hit that subscribe button. Ring the bell because we are here seven days a week for you. And if you're not following us on social media, join our Facebook group, Spaced Out Radio. We'd appreciate that. Also, follow us on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio. My personal Twitter is at Dave Scott, S-O-R. Lynn's is at Witchy Linny. Witchy Lenny on Instagram for Lynn as well. My personal Instagram is at Dave Scott S O R, and the show is at Spaced Out Radio Show. Uh, that would be a massive, massive uh, a thank you if you could follow us there as well. Appreciate all of you. We'll talk to you tomorrow night. Let's end the week strong with the Crypto Guru. <laughs>